tips after four to six weeks to stop plants from being strangled. Trim off any side shoots to keep a single stem and water carefully to prevent the seedling dying from too little water or becoming waterlogged from too much. Check your plants for pests and diseases tips after four to six Number weeks. Four. To stop Dispatch plants from being plants. strangled. The avocado seedlings are normally ready to transplant to keep three months stem from graft. And water carefully. Do not keep them any longer. The seedling dying as plants will become root bound in the or pot and not water do as well. Too much. Harden off your plants Check by your plant. keeping them in an unshared part of the nursery for about a week before, before being sold. Number four. Make sure to release the seedlings at the bottom the end of the plant nursery so they do not get plants in Phytophthora in the red food. Do keep them in it. Number five, from two on five plants apart from Phytophthora. There is a way of testing the soil for Phytophthora. them in an unshared part of the Not labs are doing it in Kenya just yet. But as we move towards certification for Phytophthora-free nurseries, these will become critical. Here is how it's done. Take a very small random sample from your batch of seedlings and test it to make sure that they are free from Phytophthora. Soil samples are flooded with water and pieces of young avocado leaf floated on the water. If Phytophthora is present in the soil sample, it will infect the leaves. Infected leaves are then tested for Phytophthora by two different methods. The first is a quick test using a color reaction on a dipstick. The second is by inspecting the leaf under a microscope. And that's it. Get in touch with iShamba for advice on how to set up a Phytophthora free nursery. What do you think? Good. Yeah? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Good morning. Wow. You're back. Bridget. Yes. <laughs> we, we were just watching her. Watching yeah. from the video. So we were watching her. She's here in person. So Kangebe, meet yes. Bridget. Bridget, meet our farmer Kangebe. Wow. Pressure to meet you Kangebe. Oh, yes. So have you watched the videos? Yeah. Any question? Yeah, I've got one for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Now since I've got a good seedling, how do I go about it? We have a surplus for you. So you have to follow oh, us. For sure. Let's go. Can I come? No. You stay here and watch the video. Oh, Bridget, I can't believe I was just watching and you're out here. Before we get to our surprise, Kangede needs to dip his feet in a foot bath to make sure he doesn't carry any soil from the deceased trees. And here is the surprise. Bridget brought some grafted disease-free seedlings, all ready to plant. So Bridget and Kangede, mm -hmm. we're finally here. So it's time to plant. Are you ready? Yes, we are ready. Any question, Kangede? Yeah, I would like to know from Bridget mm -hmm. the best way for planting. Okay. The first thing you just select uh, where you want to plant your seedlings. If you find it, you just come and do two by two. The topsoil, you keep it aside and the subsoil, you keep it the other side. The topsoil is the one which you are going to mix with the well decomposed manure. Then you fill the all again. Then from there, you look at the size of the potting bag of the seedlings. Then you use your arms, you dig the all, then you plant, then later you water. And, and, and another question, Bridget, mm -hmm. I've seen it's organic manure. Yeah. Can you use fertilizer? Yes, you can use, you can be a confessional farmer or you can be organic farmer. What I usually emphasize is on organic farming because for the fruit you get a lot of money more than the confessional one. So now you are going to use on an organic way. Let's do this. Dig a hole two feet wide by two feet deep. Separate the topsoil from the bottom soil. Mix the topsoil with well decomposed manure. Then add the soil mix back into the hole. Once the hole is full, make a small space for the seedling and place it in the hole. Farm in some soil around the sides and there you go. So Bridget, mm -hmm. now that we've planted it, mm -hmm. how much water does it need now? Because it's very dry, we are going to use like 20 liters of water. 20 liters, yes. So Bridget, mm -hmm. how much water do I need to water the, the seed? For the young seed, like now we have planted, you need 
five liters three times a week. That's it? Yeah, that's it. You're done. Yes. Ah. And shame on you. I was just inspecting them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, ah. It's okay. It's okay. Did you enjoy the ship up? Yeah, I've enjoyed it to the fullest. Yes. Thank you so much. And are you happy? Come on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Before we go, one more time, let me just say something. Okay. What do you want to say? Fight off the door. Fight off the door. Ta 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 ta. No 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 no. Ta ta ta. No. I wonder what I jumped. Hello, this is Aishamba. How can I help you? My name is George, uh, George Kangete. I had an issue with my avocados and I thought we could be of help. Sorry to hear that. What are some of the signs? My plant has got these symptoms. The leaves are falling off. They start by changing their color from green to yellow and then they fall off. And then the stem themselves, they start drying off just from the tip of the head going downwards. It sounds like your trees have phytophthora, commonly known as root rot disease. What? Phytophthora. It's a common problem for avocado trees in Kenya. Meet Kangede, a 29-year-old farmer in Makuyu, Muranga County. Before, I started farming on my own. I've been mostly employed on other farms. Through being employed, I felt like farming is giving. I thought of working for myself and also employ other people to work for me. He has leased this little shamba where he grows cabbages, tomatoes, skooma, spinach, maize, and avocados. He has started small but has big plans. In five years, I just don't want to be where I am right now today. I want to be in a place whereby I've increased my production. And instead of just planting avocado in such a simple area, I enlarge my farm. I want to make more. His beloved avocado trees seem to be suffering from a disease. You know, we've been sneaking around Aishamba trying to find out what problems farmers are facing. Oh, yes. And you've heard from one farmer that is having a huge challenge with his avocados. And he wants to go very big with them. So we dug and found out that the problem they are facing is very common in Kenya. Ah, yes. It's a disease called fight fast. Fight of Thora. Fight of Thora. Let's call it root rot. Okay. And so we invited Dr. Ruth from Calro to come and tell us more about the disease. Ah, here she is. Doc. Ah, is also here, right? Hello. Hello. So straight to it. Yes. What is ailing your avocados? I've got this issue right now. With my avocados drying up, it has made me feel like to quit this thing. Because actually after approaching, I found the root were kind of rotting. Isn't that the root rot, doctor? That is most likely phytophthora root rot. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caro, yes. shall we go have a look at the avocado trees? Oh yeah, that would be fine. But wait a minute. I think I know someone who knows everything about avocados. Let me go get her and see what she can also help us understand. Excellent idea. Okay. All right. Yes. See you later, Caro. Okay. okay, let's go have a look at the trees. This orchard has over 200 avocado trees, with the better half dying. Even though Kangede irrigates his shamba, there are few avocados to spot on his trees. What has been going on? What is this? Yes. What, what kind of a disease is this? This problem you are having here is caused by a pathogen called Phytophthora. A pathogen is? What causes the disease is what we call a pathogen. How does it damage the avocado trees? It actually causes rotting of the roots 
what happens is that the fine roots are affected and they start rotting. The problem spreads into the bigger roots of the plant, causing rotting of the entire root system. And when this happens, the plant is not able to take up water. The first symptoms you will see is that the tips of the plant start drying up towards Mainstream. the bigger stems. The other symptom you see also is the loss of leaves. And once the plant starts losing the leaves and dying back, the plant becomes stunted. And when you uproot the roots of the affected tree, you'll be able to see that they, they are rotting. Uh -huh. So now, George, yes. when you saw that in your avocados, what did you do? At first, I thought maybe I'm not doing the irrigation the right way. So you added more water. I added more water. Yes. Sometimes I did the mulching, just trying to help the tree maybe survive. But it didn't work. When can I know that my plants are now affected with this disease? It is important that you scout through your farm and check the individual trees. Once you see the twig die back, you see the yellowy, reduced leaves. Yeah. That tells you there is a problem. At what age will I know the plant is affected? If you brought in seedlings from a source that is not reliable, seedlings are already infected. Yeah. You could see this problem from as early as one year. It all depends on the rate at which the roots are rotting. Hmm. Does that make sense? Let's break it down for you. The Phytophthora disease lives in the soil. It starts eating the small roots. At this point, the tree still looks healthy, but slowly the old leaves starts to wilt and over time turns light green. As the roots stop working, the tree drops its leaves, followed by the branches dying back. Eventually, the whole tree is dead. The avocado fruits might look okay at first, but as the tree dies back, your harvest will go down and the quality will get worse until you stop getting fruit altogether. So it sounds so dangerous. How bad is it here in Kenya? The problem is really bad. It is widespread in all areas where avocado is grown, not just in Kenya, but worldwide. A farmer can actually lose the entire orchard if measures are not put in place in good time. How is this disease spread? This disease can be spread through infected planting materials. Secondly, it can also be spread through irrigation water, even through surface water. When there is rain, the soil that has the, the phytophthora onto a plant that was disease free, then it can spread from one tree to another. It can also be spread through tools that you use. If you use tools on one plant that is affected and go and use the same tool on a plant that is clean, it will get affected. To prevent the disease from spreading, Disinfect your tools as you move from one tree to the next, as wherever the soil is moved, the disease can be moved with it. Now my, my plant is already affected. How can I control the plant? You need to scout through your farm so that you are able to detect the problem early. Timely management is very important yeah. before the disease spreads to so many trees in your orchard. Once you see uh, the very initial symptoms. One of these options is to enhance the drainage of your trees. Make sure that uh, the water is seeps through and does not stand around the root region. The second thing you can be able to do is to use a lot of manure, which increases some nutrients like calcium and uh, magnesium. It makes it unfavorable for the phytophthora. But farmers, remember that these will only slow down the disease. The best way to avoid this deadly disease is by getting Phytophthora free seedlings. As Ruth went on to explain, if the tree is dead, it's best to uproot and burn it. Then find a part of your shamba away from here to plant disease free seedlings. Okay. Yeah. So, Ruth, what would you advise farmers to do? So, your farm could be clean. But depending on where you go to get your planting material, you could actually bring in materials that are affected with phytophthora to your clean farm. 
so a farmer can bring the disease from the nursery to the shamba? Yes. So first and foremost, the farmer has to make sure that they get their seedlings from nurseries that observe high health standards. Yes. The ones that ensure that the materials they are using are disease free, are pathogen free. So Ruth, how can we find out more about nurseries? Uh, Kangede, I've called um, somebody from HCD and uh, she deals a lot with nurseries and she will be able to give you that information. Sure. All right, let's go. Let's go. All right, thank you so much, Ruth. <laughs> Carol, we've covered several topics today, but how can our farmers get more information? Simple. Aishamba. What is Aishamba? Aishamba is Shamba Shape Up's call center where our farmer calls and finds experts who are going to help them understand everything agriculture. Exactly. How can they join? Simple. Call 0711-082-606. It's best to get seedlings free from Phytophthora. The Horticultural Crops Directorate, HCD, regulate fruit tree nurseries in Kenya. Sarah Ndegwa is a horticultural officer from HCD and is here to tell us more. We have a mandate to regulate uh, nurseries. So we inspect fruit tree nurseries and uh, we assist to bring up to the right standard clean seedlings. So Sarah, what do you look out for when you visit a nursery? I look at uh, the sighting of the nursery. Is it uh, far from the older crop because of disease transmission from the, the older trees? Uh, the security, there's a regulated way of uh, coming in so that uh, you can even have a foot bath so that you can disinfect so that the seedlings remain healthy. One of the things that I look for is where you do your preparation for the mixture. It's called the potting mixture. This is the mixture that you put in the paper. It is important that the nursery steam the potting mix at 70 degrees Celsius for 20 to 30 minutes in order to kill disease in the soil. Farmers, check that the nursery that you are buying your seedlings from has this method in place. Existing nursery health standards in Kenya generally do cover key elements of a high health nursery, but are not specific to types of diseases. Going forward, we hope this will be put in place. This will help nursery operators show they are certified to sell Phytophthora free seedlings and can therefore sell their good quality Phytophthora free seedlings at a better price. Get in touch with iShamba for advice on where you can get Phytophthora free nursery at the moment. George, yes. now you know what to check out for. Yeah, thank you for the help. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Today, we are learning all about a deadly avocado disease. And how you can stop it from getting onto your farm. Is it just me or is it really hard to say the name of this disease? Phytophthora. 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 Ah, it's not just me. Oh, dear Tony. Phytophthora. You'll get there. Do you remember our good friend Bridget, the expert on everything avocado, planting, pruning, harvesting? Well, looks like she's also a fundi on managing a phytophthora free nursery. And we are so lucky that she's got a video on how to do exactly that. Let me send the video to Tony. I wonder where Caro is. Hey, George. Hey. I've got a message from Caro. She's on her way back. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, she has said she sent us a video <clears throat> uh, which you show us how to make a nursery. How to construct a low cost Phytophthora free nursery. The finished nursery is made up of two parts. We have the soil shade where the potting mix is prepared and treated to make sure it's disease free. And we have the plant nursery. This is where the potting happens and the seedlings are raised, grafted 
and grown for sale. It all starts with the construction of the nursery. For the plant nursery, dig and level the ground where you'll set up the nursery. Next, create a rock base at least one foot of the ground and fill it up with gravel. This will make sure that the nursery is not deceased with soil from underneath. Finally, create a metal frame and fix a shade cloth across it to keep the seedlings protected from harsh weather. The shade cloth must come right down to the ground to stop people and animals from entering. Now, construct a simple soil shed that's connected to the nursery. This will include an area for putting together the potting mix made up of soil, sand, and manure. You also need to set up a method for steaming the potting mix to get rid of the disease that lives in the soil. This can be a proper boiler or a simple two drum steamer like this one. Make sure the finished nursery has one entrance at the soil shed and one exit at the bottom of the nursery where the plants are taken out. As we saw, the red zone here is where untreated soil comes in and then steamed to kill diseases in the soil. You then pass through a foot bath and enter the green zone. Only steamed soil is allowed into the green zone and only trained staff can enter here. This ensures that all materials taken into the green zone are disease free. The avocado seedlings ready to be sold are then taken out at the end of the green zone. It's a good idea to plant fast growing grasses, such as napier, along the outside of the nursery, so that soil from outside doesn't splash into the nursery as it will carry diseases. Huh. What do you think of that? That's good. Yes. Sure. And how do we kill the disease? I think it's time for another video. Operation of a Phytophthora free nursery. It's really important to manage your nursery well so that seedlings are sure to be Phytophthora free. There are five key steps to this. Number one, steaming the potting mix. There's a boiler. You can use charcoal, you can use firewood so that when you get the steam, which goes to pasteurize the soil. Your potting mix needs to be steamed at at least 70 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes in order to kill the Phytophthora in the soil. The cheapest method is to use a simple drum steamer like this, made out of two old 44 gallon steel drums. Here, we have two sets, but be careful as the steel can be quite thin and will need to be replaced once a year. The safer option is to install a well-constructed boiler with a pressure gauge and a safety valve like this one. Number two, potting and planting. A good system is to ensure that the soil steamed in the red zone can be taken out in the green zone through a separate opening like this. You can now use this treated soil to fill up the potting bags and plant the seeds. These will grow into what we call a root stock. Here we have used the Puebla variety. As your plants germinate, sort them so that you can graft plants of similar sizes at the same time. Number three, grafting and after grafting care. Now, here is how to graft. Tape an implant from a mature, healthy avocado tree onto a rootstock like this. The implant is also called scion. The new plant will be the same as the mother tree, which the scion came from. A popular export variety in Kenya is the Haas variety. Given good management, these grafted plants will start giving you fruit two years from planting. Unlike when you plant when you don't graft, which takes about seven years. Make sure to remove the grafting tips after four to six weeks to stop plants from being strangled. Trim off any side shoots to keep a single stem 
and water carefully to prevent the seedling dying from too little water or becoming waterlogged from too much. Check your plants for pests and diseases daily. Number four, dispatch your plants. The avocado seedlings are normally ready to transplant three months from grafting. Do not keep them any longer as plants will become root bound in the pot and will not do as well. Harden off your plants by keeping them in an unshaded part of the nursery for about a week before being sown. Make sure to release the seedlings at the bottom end of the plant nursery so they do not get in touch with Phytophthora in the red zone. And number five, confirm plants are free from Phytophthora. There is a way of testing the soil for Phytophthora. Not many labs are doing it in Kenya just yet. But as we move towards certification for Phytophthora free nurseries, these will become critical. Here is how it's done. Take a very small random sample from your batch of seedlings and test it to make sure that they are free from Phytophthora. Soil samples are flooded with water and pieces of young avocado leaf floated on the water. If Phytophthora is present in the soil sample, it will infect the leaves. Infected leaves are then tested for Phytophthora by two different methods. The first is a quick test using a color reaction on a dipstick. The second is by inspecting the leaf under a microscope. And that's it. Get in touch with iShamba for advice on how to set up a Phytophthora free nursery. What do you think? Good. Yeah? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Good morning. Wow. You're yeah, back. Bridget. Yes. <laughs> we, we were just watching her yeah. here from the video. Oh, yes. Can you why you see her again? She's, she's, here, in she's here in person. So can you ever? Meet yes. Bridget. Bridget, meet our farmer Kangebe. Wow, pressure to meet you, Kangebe. Oh, yes. So, have you watched the videos? Yeah. Any question? Yeah, I've got one for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Now, since I've got a good seedling, how do I go about it? We have a surplus for you. So, you have to follow oh, us. For sure. Let's go. Can I come? No. You stay here and watch the video. Right, Bridget, I can't believe I was just watching <laughs> and you're right here. <laughs> this is... Before we get to our surprise, Kangede needs to dip his feet in a footpath to make sure he doesn't carry any soil from the deceased trees. And here is the surprise. Bridget's brought some grafted disease-free seedlings, all ready to plant. So Bridget and Kangede, we're finally here. So it's time to plant. Are you ready? Yes, we are ready. Any question, Kangede? Yeah, I would like to know from Bridget the best way for planting. Okay. The first thing you just select the, where you want to plant your seedlings. If you find it, you just come and do two by two. The top soil you keep it aside, and the subsoil you keep it the other side. The top soil is the one which you are going to mix with the well decomposed manure. Then you fill the all again. Then from there you look at the size of the potting bag of the seedlings. Then you use your hands, you dig the all. Then you plant. Then later you water. And and, and another question, Bridget. Mm -hmm. I've seen it's organic manure. Yeah. Can you use fertilizer? Yes, you can use, you can be confessional farmer or you can be organic farmer. What I usually emphasize is on organic farming because for the fruits, you get a lot of money more than the confessional ones. So now you are going to use on an organic way. Let's do this. Dig a hole two feet wide by two feet deep. Separate the topsoil from the bottom soil. Mix the topsoil with well decomposed manure. Then add the soil mix back into the hole. Once the hole is full, make a small space for the seedling and place it in the hole. Farm in some soil around the sides and there you go. So Bridget, mm -hmm. now that we've planted it, mm -hmm. how much water does it need now? Because it's very dry, we are going to use like 20 liters of water. 20 liters, yes. So Bridget, mm -hmm. how much water do I need to water the, the seed? For the young seed, like now we have planted, you need five liters three times a week. That's it? Yeah, that's it. You're done. Yes. Ah. 
And shame on you. I was, I, I was just inspecting them. <laughs> uh, so, ah, uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yes. Did you enjoy the ship up? Yeah, I've enjoyed it. It's simple. Yes. Thank yes. you so, so much. And are you happy? Come on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Before we go, one more time, let me just say something. Okay. What do you want to do? Fight off the door. Ta 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 ta. No 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 no. Ta ta ta. Oh, no. I wonder what I jump. <laughs> Hello, this is Aishamba. How can I help you? My name is George. Uh, George Kangete. I had an issue with my avocados and I thought we could be of help. Sorry to hear that. What are some of the signs? My plant has got these symptoms. The leaves are falling off. They start by changing their color from green to yellow and then they fall off. And then the stem themselves, they start drying off just from the tip of the head going downwards. It sounds like your trees have phytophthora, commonly known as root rot disease. What? Phytophthora. It's a common problem for avocado trees in Kenya. <laughs> Meet Kangede, a 29-year-old farmer in Makuyu, Muranga County. Before, I started farming on my own. I've been mostly employed on other farms. Through being employed, I felt like farming is giving. I thought of working for myself and also employ other people to work for me. He has leased this little shamba where he grows cabbages, tomatoes, skuma, spinach, maize, and avocados. He has started small but has big plans. In five years, I just don't want to be where I am right now today. I want to be in a place whereby I've increased my production. And instead of just planting avocado in such a simple area, I enlarge my farm. I want to make more. His beloved avocado trees seem to be suffering from a disease. You know, we've been sneaking around Aishamba trying to find out what problems farmers are facing. Oh, yes. And you've heard from one farmer that is having a huge challenge with his avocados and he wants to go very big with them. So we dug and found out that the problem they are facing is very common in Kenya. Ah, yes. It's a disease called fight Fight of Thora. Fight of Thora. Let's call it root rot. Okay. And so we invited Dr. Ruth from Calro to come and tell us more about the disease. Ah, here she is. Doc. Hello. He's also here, right? Hello. 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 So straight to it, Hangeve, yes. what is ailing your avocados? I've got this issue right now with my avocados drying up. It has made me feel like to quit this thing. Because actually after approving, I found the root were kind of rotting. Isn't that the root rot, doctor? That is most likely phytophthora root rot. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caro, yes. shall we go have a look at the avocado trees? Oh yeah, that would be fine, but wait a minute. But I know someone who knows everything about avocados. Let me go get her and see what she can also help us understand. Excellent idea. Yeah. All right. Yeah. See you later, Caro. Okay, let's go have a look at the trees. This orchard has over 200 avocado trees with the better half die. Even though Kangede irrigates his shamba, there are few avocados to spot on his trees. What has been going on? What is this? Yes. What, what kind of a disease is this? This problem you are having here is caused by a pathogen called Phytophthora. A pathogen is? What causes the disease is okay. what we call a pathogen. How does it damage the avocado tree? It actually causes rotting of the roots. What happens is that the fine roots are affected and they start rotting. The problem spreads into the bigger roots of the plant, causing rotting of the entire root system. And when this happens, the plant is not able to take up water. 
the first symptoms you will see is that the tips of the plant they start drying up towards the bigger stems. The other symptom you see also is the loss of leaves. And once the plant starts losing the leaves and dying back, the plant becomes stunted. And when you uproot the roots of the affected tree, you'll be able to see that they, they are rotting. Uh, uh, so now, George, yes. when you saw that in your avocados, what did you do? At first, I thought maybe I'm not doing the irrigation the right way. So you added more water. I added more water. Yes. Sometimes I did the mulching, just trying to help the tree maybe survive. But it didn't work. When can I know that my plants are now affected with this disease? It is important that you scout through your farm and check the individual trees. Mm -hmm. Once you see the twig die back, you see the yellowy, reduced leaves. Yeah. That tells you there is a problem. At what age will I know the plant is affected? If you brought in seedlings from a source that is not reliable, seedlings are already infected. Yeah. You could see this problem from as early as one year. It all depends on the rate at which the roots are rotting. Hmm. Does that make sense? Let's break it down for you. The Phytophthora disease lives in the soil. It starts eating the small roots. At this point, the tree still looks healthy, but slowly the old leaves starts to wilt and over time turns light green. As the roots stop working, the tree drops its leaves, followed by the branches dying back. Eventually, the whole tree is dead. The avocado fruits might look okay at first, but as the tree dies back, your harvest will go down and the quality will get worse until you stop getting fruit altogether. So it sounds so dangerous. How bad is it here in Kenya? The problem is really bad. It is widespread in all areas where avocado is grown, not just in Kenya, but worldwide. A farmer can actually lose the entire orchard if measures are not put in place in good time. How is this disease spread? This disease can be spread through infected planting materials. Secondly, it can also be spread through irrigation water, even through surface water. When there is rain, the soil that has the, the phytophthora onto a plant that was disease free, then it can spread from one tree to another. It can also be spread through tools that you use. If you use tools on one plant that is affected and go and use the same tool on a plant that is clean, it will get affected. To prevent the disease from spreading, Disinfect your tools as you move from one tree to the next, as wherever the soil is moved, the disease can be moved with it. Now my, my plant is already affected. How can I control the plant? You need to scout through your farm so that you are able to detect the problem early. Timely management is very important yeah. before the disease spreads to so many trees in your orchard. Once you see uh, the very initial symptoms. One of these options is to enhance the drainage of your trees. Make sure that uh, the water is seeps through and does not stand around the root region. The second thing you can be able to do is to use a lot of manure, which increases some nutrients like calcium and uh, magnesium. It makes it unfavorable for the phytophthora. But farmers, remember that these will only slow down the disease. The best way to avoid this deadly disease is by getting Phytophthora free seedlings. As Ruth went on to explain, if the tree is dead, it's best to uproot and burn it. Then find a part of your shamba away from here to plant disease free seedlings. Okay. Yeah. So, Ruth, what would you advise farmers to do? So, your farm could be clean. But depending on where you go to get your planting material, you could actually bring in materials that are affect
Welcome back, everybody. Ding a ling a ling. We are ready to start. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed your lunch and are satisfied with full tummies. And there was delicious avocado on offer. I believe the guacamole is still to come. Didn't quite make it to lunch, but it will appear at some stage. So I guess I should briefly introduce myself. I've been popping up and down all morning, interrupting, causing general disturbances and making people stop asking questions, which is actually the reason we are here is to engage and ask questions. However, <laughs> I do try to need to keep us to time somewhat. So my name is Stephanie Montgomery. I am a program manager with New Zealand Plant and Food Research. However, I am actually based in Cambodia in Southeast Asia. And I am part of the International Development Unit, um, taking care of projects in uh, Asia and Africa, as such uh, the Kenya Avocado Project here. So it's a delight to be back in Kenya with you all again. And uh, my background is actually, you may notice I have an Australian accent. So uh, just to confuse the issue further, I'm actually Australian um, and I'm an agronomist by trade. Um, my background is in Australian and Southeast Asian farming systems. So from large scale farmers to smallholders, um, but always with a bent of uh, conservation agriculture and um, really protecting the soil resource base and maintaining that sustainability and productivity and importantly, profitability of our farming systems whilst looking after the environment. So my PhD was based in farming systems research through an Australian university, but in Cambodia with smallholder farmers. So um, I'm really pleased to, to see the focus here on smallholder farmers and, and as they do comprise, I believe, 70% um, of the avocado industry. So definitely the majority and a very important aspect. But this afternoon, we're going to kick off with uh, Dr. Alan Wolf, who is a post-harvest scientist with um, PFR. And he is the team leader at Plant Food Research with over 30 years worth of experience on all post-harvest and disinfestation of aspects of avocados. He's worked on avocado oil research for over 20 years, including uh, with Olivado since its very inception, and also um, in Australia, USA, and recently helping set up a new plant in Myanmar. So we'll hand over to Alan now to set the scene. Um, and then we have several more speakers this afternoon and a forum to end with like this morning's session. So I do hope you can all stay awake because this is a really important topic of sustainability of avocados in East Africa and Kenya particularly. Thanks, Alan. Kia ora. Welcome. Um, so yeah, I'll just throw up some, some ideas for some thoughts looking for some global perspectives. We were just in, um, in the World Avocado Congress was in New Zealand. We had 1,100 and something um, people attending, and it was a great opportunity to hear different ideas from all, all around the world. So the good news, avocado, the green gold, pe plenty of people have heard about this, sometimes talked about the oil. Uh, very strong increase in consumption. You can see on the graph here, this is the USA, but overall the world consumption of avocado is increasing really quite strongly. Uh, as an example, when I first started um, avocados, it was 300 grams per person per year, which is one av biggest avocado. And now it's more than four kilograms. And many Asian countries are also getting into things like, so like China, a country that all of us sort of thought, oh, when Chinese, you know, avocados just don't work for Asian um, people. And, and recently there was an interesting talk at the conference where they'd found a dish where avocados just sort of worked and Korea are starting to get into it. So the world um, demand for avocados is increasing. So that's, those are good news. <clears throat> oh, it just works. Sorry, it just worked before. So it's trendy, there's smoothies, avocados on toast. Everybody knows there's endless memes and discussions in New Zealand that that's the reason the next generation can't afford a house because they're paying $14 for avocados on toast. Um, it's healthful. Uh, there's many healthful compounds in it, vitamin E, alpha-tocopherol, alpha um, sterols, uh, lutein, quite high in fiber. And so it's quite a whole food. It's actually got a reasonable amount of protein in it. Well, the most protein for a fruit, but that doesn't mean it's like eating a steak. 
uh, its benefits for potentially for weight loss, diabetes. And you can mm -hmm. see, you know, if you Google eight reasons to eat avocados, there's a lot of work going on trying to improve the image of avocados that it's not a fat um, product. But there's some bad news. So oversupply is coming um, or it's probably here for some things. So we've had very strong planting for many years. Many people have been finding it very difficult to get hold of avocados if you can't just put an orchard in next year. But there's some massive orchard areas going in. Anybody who's been to South America, Peru, um, just unbelievable areas of land that cost very little, the water's free, and it doesn't rain. So just amazing places. These are all starting to come into production. So we're looking at some increasing world supply. And so when you look at places like Australia, um, last year, Western Australia finally came online. It was no surprise. We all knew Western Australia was going to do that. And the price of avocados dropped massively, which really impacted New Zealand. The USA, prices are currently quite low due to oversupply. And overall, this is just not sustainable economically. At the conference, somebody who was involved in the Californian industry said to me, we need to remove 10 or 20% of the fruit, or otherwise it's going to be a train wreck. And he was saying, so avocado oil processing is a real beneficial thing. And you'll see many people talking about how taking that, that poor fruit out of the market, the bottom part of the fruit of the market can actually really improve outturn or sorry, returns for other people as well. So we really need to see some of those things. But with increasing supply, that means importers have more choices. And it isn't rocket science. When the supply is high, the importers can start to get more picky. They can start to criticize every mark on your fruit. Um, everybody knows that when a market's short, you can send poor quality fruit. The fruit's taken up, nobody argues. But as soon as the market gets a bit um, more full, people will start to push you down on product after product and drop the price. And as everybody knows, I'm only a scientist, you know, but as everybody knows, if the price is low, trying to reestablish a decent price is very hard. So it's easy to go down, much harder to get that price back up. And then we've got more bad press. This is quite an impressively scary picture, isn't it? So this is um, Rotten, which is a series which is on Netflix. Uh, many of you may have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to watch it. It's a whole series about food supply chains and the bad things that are happening. And what's the first one? Avocado. And what's it about? So it talks about um, drought in Chile, where basically whole rivers are being taken to irrigate avocados. Villages are having to truck in water. Um, ex people are being exploited with guns just to keep producing. And in, in Mexico, you've got the criminals who are involved. And in basically the drug lords have now moved to avocados because avocados are a big deal. And they're basically um, holding people to ransom to pay 10 or 20% of their price. And they know exactly what's going on. Anyway, it's a terrible story. And that's, that's what's being seen on the, out on... Uh, the news. Could we could we see the presenter? No, you don't need to see the presenter. <clears throat> Google searches. If you do a Google search and sort of put in avocado uh, drugs, you get this is the list of things. And what are the questions that come up? Are avocados run by drug cartels? Why boycott avocados? What what is the impetus for this? I mean, these are these are bad things to read, right? So. Those things are out there. They get into social media. People start saying, you shouldn't be eating your avocados. This stuff's bad. So we've got to, we've got to face some of these issues and think about what to do it. So what's, what's going to happen in, in uh, Kenya? Apparently, you're going to double your production in five years, though I would question whether the demand is going to increase. And uh, our great leader, Lusika, is saying you're going to take over Mexico. You're going to be the number one producer. There's a very big leap, by the way, to go from number two producer to number one. But anyway, if Lucy Kay wants it to happen, it will happen. So these are just some suggestions. Minimal sustainable production. So I've got a, a few pointers. Minimal, minimize your water usage. Steve's going to do a talk. He's got a model. These are helping you to not overuse water and to work out how you can get the most out of your trees with the least water. Obviously, you've seen the pictures of avocados, but famously, if you look up almonds, and look how many gallons of water it takes to produce one almond nut. It is just shocking. And that's the sort of stuff people um, find out about. How can you maximize your impact of water? Mulching on the ground if possible. Don't till the ground. You know, chopping up the soil underneath the trees. That's really not what we want to do. And considering dams, water collection, whatever you do, 
we're wanting to do it so it doesn't impact people. So nutritional sustainability, uh, uh, Steve, Steve, yes, Steve, Steve um, has done a lot of work on nitrogen, a really hot topic in New Zealand because of our agriculture um, and horticulture. Nitrogen leaching into groundwater is extremely bad, terrible for um, um, pregnant women. <clears throat> so you need to be working to have the minimal impact so that you're seen to be doing well. And if you're taking water supplies away and cattle haven't got enough water, you're in the wrong place. I really encourage you, often this is a smallholder farmers, I appreciate that, but try and stay organic for as long as possible. Minimal fertilizers, minimal use of insecticides, fungicides, use soft, soft fungicides, soft options, because it's a pretty much a one-way journey. If you start to come in with heavier and heavier chemicals, it's very difficult to move back the other way. So you have a real advantage that these avocados seem to get by on these pretty minimal inputs that the smallholder farmers are doing. So that's a great option. Local consumption, it's great to see the avocados that we've been um, having here today. <clears throat> if you're consuming more of your avocados in this country, you're minimizing waste, you're minimizing your carbon footprint because you're consuming it here. Obviously the health benefits, food security, reducing cost of living, all of those things are just coming. If you can get your local people to just use more avocado. And it always, amazed, when we first started, it was called dog food, which is pretty terrible when you look at the benefits of avocado. How do we increase local consumption? Well, we've done that a bit today. All of us have had a bit more of a go at having some different avocado, but getting <coughs> chefs on board, influencers, buy local, save the world, any of those options that can increase your av local avocado consumption are gonna have big benefits economically, um, Health-wise, they're all good thing, angles to sort of go. And you need to, you've got, you've got all this, you need more corn chips. I had to bring corn chips from New Zealand when we were trying to make guacamole at the factory. So you need to get using that guacamole and, and we're going to have some later. I've got some good recipes. I've already sent some to Lucy here. Um, socially sustainable. I guess looking back at those bad images that you saw, uh, one thing that New Zealand, uh, New Zealand um, Kenya really stands out for is your smallholder farmers. You have so many smallholder farmers. That's a big difference for many people in the world. And ways of bringing that together, you can use that as a promotion, as a brand, if you like, for, for Kenyan avocados. And it really is a, a, a really advantage to do that compared to these mega farms in South America, right? Where you've got, where you've got farms that are 2,000 hectares. So that's a real benefit. Fruit theft, um, obviously I hear it really is a very significant problem. It is a reputational risk, potentially for your brand. If people start picking up that sort of stuff, putting it on social media, then you start to end up with a bad halo. So how, how to avoid that? I certainly don't have the answers for how you sort that out. Um, overall, you need rigor, appropriate systems of support, um, all the things that people have talked about here and having a really strong links between the growers and the exporters. The middlemen, I understand the collectors are really important to some extent, but you lose your traceability and that makes things quite challenging. Dry matter, I'll talk more tomorrow and Steve will talk about the time to harvest model, but having good quality fruit when you harvest is fundamental and I'll talk at length about that tomorrow. So, asante sana, kia ora and thank you. Is that all right timing? One minute over, was it? There we go. You, we'll let you on the stage again tomorrow. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, hopefully that's given you all food for thought. And I'm sure there's questions branching on, off from that talk, but we're in the interest of time going to have to save the questions until the uh, forum session at the, at the end of this session. Uh, and continue on now with uh, Dr. Anthony Esalaba. So could I also just ask you firstly to put your phones on silent? Uh, that would be greatly appreciated and hopefully not answer them, but pay keen attention to the speakers at the front. But if you must, I understand. However, I'd appreciate if they are on silent to avoid disturbances to everyone else. Um, so, Dr. Anthony Asalaba uh, has over 35 years experience as a research scientist in land and water management and agroforestry with a particular emphasis on integrated soil nutrient management and climate smart agriculture. 
He's a soil scientist and now an independent consultant after retiring from Cairo uh, nearly two years ago, where he was the assistant director for the Natural Resources Systems. Recently, he was the chairman of the Soil Science Society of East Africa, Kenya chapter for eight years and has published extensively throughout his career. So I'm sure it'll be easy to find further publications of his if uh, it sparks an interest for you today. But I welcome um, Anthony to the stage. Um, thank you. Hopefully to... Yes, it's here. I hope so too. I'm not sure the trick. I think be patient. <laughs> Where do I point? Pointer is here, but it's not moving. Is it somewhere here? That's the laser, okay. It's forward, but it's, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. That's a small trick. So basically the title you have in the program and what I'm giving you look different, but they're the same. If we just listen to Wolf, point number one on sustainable production was basically what I'm going to do. I'm just going to expound on that. So I'm not completely off track. I've been told 10 minutes. I was, I've been given 20 minutes, so I'll stick to that. My, my presentation is uh, basically on soil requirements, nutrients, soil health, soil fertility, climate change, water management, I won't touch because the next presenter will work on that. Then I look at how you integrate crop, soil, water, and integrated soil fertility management. You won't hear me mentioning too much avocado, but everything applies to avocado. <laughs> so I won't go through the introduction. People have talked about avocado, how Kenya is the sixth producer in the world. Then where it came from in Mexico. And sometimes they are used for some of the papers I found in for agroforestry and soil conservation, erosion control. Some of you may not even think that way. Now, I'm not a, an avocado agronomist, so I'll avoid things that I think apply to agronomy and the other presenters presented. But basically, there's a lack of information on sustainable horticultural practices like water, fertilizer, and intercultural questions, operation. Now, most of the avocado orchards, you know, are raised by seedlings. So there's, there are some issues to do with that. However, I'm more interested in the seedling water nutrient and other management practices. So I'll take you on another long journey before we get back to where. We are concerned about nutrient absorption by avocados. We need to standardize these nutrient requirements of avocados. We don't have much work in Kenya on that. Most of the data and information I have are from other countries, not necessarily from Kenya. So this is the avocado map for Kenya. The reason I gave you this was simply to, to show you that the areas that are green are the avocado areas. And the problem we have in this area, these are the soil map of Kenya. For us who are soil scientists, we know the different soils. There are different soils in the whole country. We need to know that before we can determine there are different kinds of soils, different names. Many of you don't like soil science, I know, but I'll just inform you. <laughs> this is a, a, an acid soil map of Kenya. I've been working on the manual handbook for Kenya and the areas that are, are avocado growing areas basically fall in the same region, we have acid soils. And David Priest discussed a bit of that, didn't go to the detail. But if you are going to grow avocado in some of these areas, you have to take care of lining. So we are launching our lining handbook for Kenya soon in the next few months, we are just winding up. So I'm trying to promote myself also. Now soil, very few of you like it, I know, good for food security, water security, energy security, climate change, abatement, ecosystem services, and biodiversity protection. I'm glad to hear Phytosora is actually a soil bone disease with my colleague here, Mata, and we've discussed a few points. Some of the fertilizers Dave is promoting may help, and we'll look into that. The Wonder Grow. Uh, Dave Priest, we also have it. We were trying to work on it in our labs before I retired. Ruth Amata is here to continue with some of this work. What does the soil do? It provides water, there's carbon, there's primary production, there's a habitat, and there's nutrient cycling. 
There are different kinds of soils. For some of you have never seen, most of you have seen soils. You know black soils, you know red soils and all that. Sandy soils, clay soils and all that. So there are different kinds of, of soils. Now, what are the requirements from our manuals that we have in Kenya? The pH should be between five and seven. It does not tolerate uh, flooding or poor drained soils. Then under phytophthora, you've discussed that. You need a good structure. Does not tolerate salt. I didn't show you, but the rest 80% of the country may be problematic soils that have saline, alkaline, and sodic soils. So moving into other areas, increase production in Kenya will have its own challenges. For example, here we did, I found a paper from Maseno University where they did a survey, like Victoria Basin, my colleagues from uh, Maseno University. And from their results, you realize the, the problems was, water logging was a big problem, flooding, next, soil fertility, and none of you talks of this, 62%. So you can see how important soil is. And soil salinity, this is still soil. So you can see the problems, in avocado are not necessarily at the level of which you are thinking. There are also underlying problems that you need to tackle as you tackle the other market quality and all that. Uh, so, So, potassium is also required. Most food crops require a lot of potassium. Sulfur deficiency is a problem. Sulfur is yellowing. Nitrogen is also yellowing, yellowing, but you have to know which part it starts from. Calcium is required. Magnesium is required. Zinc is also very important. And right now in Kenya, we have a zinc deficiency, but in many soils that we have analyzed in the last few years. We have some publications on that that is coming out or is already out. Manganese is also a problem. Iron is a problem somewhere. And borrow. I had somebody talking about some flower abortion and all that. I know in beans, boron deficiency results in flower abortion. I don't know if it's the same case with the avocado, but we can look at that. But boron is quite in very small amounts. If you apply too much again, it becomes toxic. So there are toxic levels also. So basically what we are need to be concerned with avocados is soil health. The whole soil health issues, they are physical, chemical, and biological. Now soil health describes the capacity of a soil to meet performance standards to nutrient, water, and so forth. Some may include biological nitrogen fixation and other issues. Now, decline in soil fertility is a major constraint. As I told you, macronutrients N, P, K, sulfur, and micronutrients have been identified as deficient in Kenyan soils, depending on the site and location. When you go into new areas, you need to do soil testing to determine which nutrients are required. For avocado, you also need to do plant analysis, leaf analysis, before you give recommendations. How do we solve this? Recently, a paradigm shift, we use integrated soil fertility management where we use organic, inorganic, different uh, uh, germplasm varieties, seed and planting materials, and adapt them to local conditions. That's the way we are going in soils. But I can see Olivado was saying organic. I don't know if they questioned me about the organic. We'll talk about that when the time comes. So we believe ISFM will be more productive where you combine organic and inorganic you reduce your fertilizer use by using organics in combination with inorganic. Now, another problem is climate change. With climate change, there are changes with water requirements and temperature, 
We've done a lot of climate change studies. We do analog site studies with different crops. We can still do that with avocado. We don't have to start from the beginning. They're already orchards and they are different uh, ecological conditions. We simply go ahead and model. I'm looking forward to listening to the water presentation. I believe he'll be doing a lot of modeling. Eh? So I'll skip the water section of my presentation, water management, because that's going to be covered by somebody coming, but I'll introduce. Mainly, we don't use a lot of uh, irrigation in our, uh, I believe in our avocado production, except on certain commercial farms where they have drip irrigation. We believe there's enough rain, but there are times you need moisture, water, even if you have a lot of rain. So what we call crop water requirements are studies we need to do at different times, at different phenological stages of the avocado tree. We need to model that. I look forward to hearing that from whoever is going to talk about water. I don't know who it is, but I was supposed to introduce this for him. So irrigation, not a big issue, but drip irrigation is coming. It's becoming very important in Kenya, especially on the big commercial farms. Basically small scale farmers in dry areas use some kind of basin irrigation. We have technologies for water management that I'll go through what we call TIMS, Technologies and Innovations for Management Practices in Cairo. They've been compiled. I'll reproduce them here for Lusike if she doesn't mind, since we are the ones who develop them anyway. So we need to develop appropriate integrated crop soil, water, and technologies for avocado. And I want to ask any of you who has all these technologies in Kenya, please tell me. You can raise your hand. We can discuss about that. I'll list them here. We have developed these technologies in Cairo. They are in our team's manuals, but they are not developed for avocado. They are developed for other crops, but they apply to avocado. So we have ISFM. We need to do rapid soil and uh, plant testing. We need to use inorganic fertilizers. We need manure mulching, intercropping, green manure, and early cropping. For those who don't know, early cropping is a kind of agroforestry practice where you can have crops in between the alleys of the main tree crops. How many of you know about that? I was reading about coffee intercropped with the avocado in other countries, but not in Kenya. I don't think so. It has been illegal even to grow trees with coffee until very recently. <laughs> then there are soil and water management uh, practices we have in Kenya. We know a lot about it on cereals and legumes, contour bands, bench terraces, stone lines, retention ditches. Last week I was doing retention ditches on my avocado orchard somewhere in Western Kenya. So I know about that. Grass strips, trash lines. How many of you have thought about that? These are the technologies you need in avocado orchards. Rainwater harvesting from roof, conservation agriculture. My previous presenter was talking minimum tillage, mulching. So I'm just giving you what he summarized in a few points in detail. Earth dams, roof catchment, sources of water for the avocado. Okay. So what do we need to do research? As I've told you, I won't do the agronomic. I'll just go to the soils part. And I don't want to go to the details. We need to do a bit of research on what we call 4K stewardship. We need the right type, rate and method and timing of fertilizer. I'm sure my colleague from ETG is very happy to hear this, fertilizer people. This is the first time we are mentioning that. We do this in cereal and legumes quite often. We need to do some macronutrient and micronutrient trials for NPK and also the micronutrients whether they should be applied on the soil or whether we should spray. Each has its benefits and uh, lack of benefits. We need to do the fertilizer sources. This is where the fertilizer companies are happy. We have Mavuno fertilizer, Minjingu, Baraka, ETG is here. Is anybody from Yara here? And Mavuno? You tend to ignore the fertilizer people and they are not happy about that. <laughs> So we know about farmyard manure and combinations of manure. We know about mycorrhiza. These are fungi, nutrient cycling, and soil and water conservation, water harvesting, and tillage practices. I'm just summarizing. That's what we need to do. Thank you very much. 
I hope I've taken five minutes. This, this normally takes me six hours when I'm training, but <laughs> so you can imagine what I'm giving you. Yes, yes, yes. So I can see. Yes, thank, thank you. you. We'll bring yeah. you back to the panel. So as you know, all the presenters will come back for the panel at the end of this session. So don't worry, you have a chance to ask questions and get deeper into these subjects. But thank you, Anthony, for a, a, very, a very quick look at soils. And uh, he's saying that many of you don't like soils or soil research. I don't know about you, but uh, I think it's one of the most important things. Um, whenever you know, farmers over the years have often sought my advice as an agronomist on whether to buy a farm or not and whether to buy this patch of land or not. And I was like, well, what you're buying is the soil. So the most important thing to look at is the soil. Don't worry about the infrastructural resources in terms of a shed here and a house there and whatnot. Obviously the catchment and different things like that are important, but ultimately you're buying the soil. So that's always the number one priority. And then the others flow on from there to form part of the package. So thank you, Anthony. It is a really important subject to cover in this session. We are going to move more into irrigation and water use of avocados now. Um, uh, with Dr. Steve Green from, again, from New Zealand Plant and Food Research. Yes, do come up, Steve. Many of you have seen Steve throughout the day, ringing a bell or two. Steve is a senior research scientist from PFR, from the Sustainable Production Systems Modelling Group at uh, PFR in Palmerston North, for those of you familiar with New Zealand. His research interests include um, many, many things, and he has a myriad of experience. However, he really loves the design and construction of instrumentation to measure water and nutrient flows through the soil and the development of system models to predict the effect of land use activity on the receiving environment. And he's going to go into detail on that today for Kenya, um, ooh, hopefully. His work in New Zealand is aimed at improving understanding through measurement and modeling of the dynamics of water and nutrient flows in orchard systems. So he has a lot of experience in this area. But aside from working on avocados in Kenya, Steve also works in Dubai, has done for a long time on the salinity impacts of day palms, forestry and field crops, and also in Australia on apples and pears. So he is quite the authority. And um, when we get to the panel session, I'm sure there's going to be many questions for you, Steve, and a lot of interest in this model we've been long awaiting for. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, cheers, Steph. Uh, I was a bit worried the click had got walked off on the last talk, but uh, it's back again. So the title of my talk, well, I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing within our program um, for the last 10 years, uh, trying to understand the water requirements for the avocado trees with a specific focus on, you're a farmer, you tell me, oh, I got seven year old trees and blinking way over there somewhere, how much water should I, should I um, set aside in my dam or should I have available in my irrigation scheme or should I pour on my trees every day to sustain them and produce my fruit? Well, this is the sort of question I'm trying to answer with a simple tool um, that we will provide at the end of the project. Um, okay, got a pointer. Um, so, as a bit of a background, we all know um, the climate here has two long droughts, uh, uh, short drought, long drought. Trees are always under drought and they could benefit from some irrigation, right? It, during extreme drought, I've been here and I've seen trees losing leaves. I've seen fruit falling off. I've seen a huge loss of productivity, which with a little bit of inter intervention, either making the trees smaller or providing some water, you can overcome some of the pro problems and you can produce um, better fruit from it. Now, the other thing, if your trees are stressed this year, there's gonna be some carryover effect next year. There's gonna be loss of fruitfulness, fewer flowers, you know, less vigorous shoots, and maybe you're gonna impact on the root system as well. So irrigation can alleviate a lot of, the, lot of the problems. And the question I'm trying to answer through our project is how much irrigation should I add to my trees and kind of when should I start irrigating? Whoops, 
pushed the wrong button then. Um, so well, I'm an experimental scientist, but I also like to build gadgets. And so I take a, a measurement approach. Everyone believes if I measure something, that's the answer. But I also take a modeling approach because if I'm doing my work here, geez, I got to be able to take the answers and the advice anywhere in Kenya, not just, you know, in where I'm been working. So we do that via modeling. And we've been working in this project with Olivardo to study the water use of the Haas and the Fuerte trees. We've developed, and I'll show you, we verified it, just a simple little water balance model that could help you understand from the tree size or the tree age, how much water that tree is using in the climate that it's growing in. And so in this presentation, I'll just demonstrate the science that we've used behind our thing we call the tree water use calculator. And then I'll just show you some model outputs that you can say, geez, I didn't know in January, I should be putting on 15 liters of water every day for this tree. Uh, and if I do that, it'll survive. You know, and, and we'll show you some of the stuff and then hopefully you'll have some training material that develops from the programs that then you can ask, ask those questions to the computer model and to the software and it'll provide you some informed guidance and some guidelines on how to manage your water because it's scarce. You've got, you, you've got to pay for the infrastructure to deliver the water to the farm so you don't want to overspec the pipe when you only need this much. Okay, so that's we're trying to, you don't want to build a huge dam if you only need a little bit, you know, so we, we're just trying to give you some guidance on how much water those trees are using. And then you can make decisions later on about how much storage you might need through the dry periods. I guess that's the button. So I said before, I like to build gadgets, the best place to ask to find out if the tree needs water is to ask it right so I build little sensors that go into the tree and they measure how much water is flowing up the stem and so every hour our computers are running in the field and they're measuring five liters an hour 10 liters an hour 15 liters an hour two liters an hour depends on the climate depends on the size of the tree depends on the leaf area depends on the water availability in the soil, depends on lots of things. So over three or four years, we've been doing some measurements in the avocado trees here, and we've been examining their response to the microclimate, to the temperature, the humidity, the wind speed, the rainfall, the soil moisture. And we've been building up an understanding about how those trees, when they're young, or they're a little bit older, or they're mature, how much water they require um, for, for their, to, meet, to match their water use. And we do, some of that understanding comes from direct measurement, right? Direct measurement of the, whoops, wrong button again. Direct measurement in the tree. We also want to know how much water is stored in the soil. And so we put our instruments in the soil and they measure the volumetric water content. If I took a bucket of soil, 10 liter pail, and then these sensors measure the volumetric water content. So I would know how many liters of water there are for a given volume of soil or a given depth. So we measure volumetric water content and that's liters of water per liters of soil. And we can also convert that to an equivalent depth of water. And as scientists, we use millimeters of water stored in the root zone of the plants because we then know millimeters of water in the soil and we know millimeters of water from rain. So the two units are the same and we can make a simple balance. I know how much water's in the soil, millimeters. I know how much it's rained, millimeters. And I know how much water the trees are using. Uh-oh, got to make a conversion for that. I got to convert my liters per day to millimeters per day for the calculations. And I'll show you how to do that. It's pretty simple, okay? So we know tree water use changes over the season. And so we want to know what is the seasonal weather like? You know, so we, we set up at Gary's factory, Olivado, we set up a baseline station to collect our climate data. And the sorts of things we need to understand the climate is solar radiation, that's sunshine, air temperature, when it's warm, 
when it's cool. And we'll show you what we do with the temperature data tomorrow when we try to look at fruit maturity and fruit development. So we need temperature, we need relative humidity because the air can be dry and suck water out of the soil or the plants, or it can be moist and not uh, evaporate as much water. And we would need to know wind speed and obviously for a water balance, we need to know the rainfall. And from all of these measurements, we can calculate a thing called ET naught. That is essentially the evaporation of water from the farm on a unit area basis. And again, millimeters of water is one liter of water per square meter of ground area. So it's a pretty simple thing to convert. Okay, once you get the simple, yeah, the tool that allows you to do it. So most of my discussion will either be in millimeters, a depth of water, or it'll be in liters per tree. Because you're a farmer, you know I've got 10 five-year-old trees, and now I'm gonna tell you how much water each of those trees is going to use through the whole season. And now you'll be able to know how much water I need to hose onto the tree when it's dry. That's the, that's the aim, but we, we don't want you to do too much calculations. We wanna give you the answer. Right? But to do that, we have to take an awful lot of science and whatever you do, dumb it down into simple rules of thumb that are appropriate and applicable, which is another reason why we need to be doing this sort of work in Kenya and not back in New Zealand because the climate's different and the soils are different. Whoops. Come on, baby. Okay. So... We were fortunate on this program to get access to three or four farms where we, where, they were, where we were able to set up a climate station. So I'm just setting a pole up there for my weather station, on-farm weather station. And this farm had trees of different ages, some three-year-old trees, some five-year-old trees, some 10-year-old trees, some 15-year-old trees, okay? And so I put my instruments into the trees and I measure the, the actual water use of the tree. There it is. I've got two lines there. One line is the, the blue line is the liters per hour that this 15 year old tree is transpiring. Okay, eight liters an hour during the middle of the day, right? Which adds up to about 80 liters per day is the water use of the tree. There's a, whoops, wrong one. There's a, there's a little dip here. And that's just when it's cloudy, when it's, when it's overcast, when the evaporative demand has dropped. And you can see the tree is just responding exactly to the microclimate. I did miss a slide there once. Hang on. Yeah, okay. First thing is, on a sunny day, trees use more water. And I'm just plotting the water use in green and the sunshine. A cloudy day, you can see tree is just responding exactly to the sunshine. So you think about uh, irrigation, if there's been a long period of cloudy days, it's going to be using a little bit less water than a whole run of cloud-free days. Okay, tree water use is basically proportional to the sunshine on the day. Okay, that's the first rule of thumb. The second rule of thumb is, the tree water use also responds to the humidity of the air. And we represent the humidity in terms of a thing called the vapor pressure deficit. It's a combination of the temperature and the humidity. But if you know the VPD, the vapor pressure deficit, you can see the trees are just responding. A sunny, sunny, hot day using 80 liters per day or eight liters an hour. And then on a cloudy, cool day, tree water use has dropped down to about two or three liters an hour or 20 to 30 liters a day. So the trees are really responding to the microclimate. Okay, that's when the soil water is non-limiting. Okay, so in November, after the long rains, there's plenty of water in the soil and these trees were using 80 liters a day. Look forward two months later, long dry period. The tree water use has dropped down to three, uh, about 30 liters a day. So, so more than half of the transpiration 
more than half of the productivity has been lost because of this drought period that's pretty early in the season, just you know, mid-February. But um, what happened then? A little bit of rain, and all of a sudden the tree water use kicks up. It responds. It's very responsive to, in this case, rainfall, but in another case, it could be irrigation. And so you could read the ratios. If without irrigation, that's my productivity. With irrigation, there's my productivity. So you've got a tremendous opportunity if you water your trees to increase their productivity. All right, so that's the second message I'll give you. But Bob tells us don't overwater because if the soil or the root zone is flooded, you're going to have tree health issues. So our job collectively in the project is to tell you how much to put on so you're sustainable and you're not overwatering, you're not wasting your water. So I see this rainfall here was. 45 millimeters on this day and the effect of the rainfall lasted a week so within one week the trees have consumed enough of that water and it would have whoops oh, I've broken the some people some people who come to my talks think I do that on purpose but honestly I didn't um, and I don't have any glasses so. anyway I've got help here. So your irrigation or your rainfall is going to last about a week. And after that, you're going to have to return to irrigating your tree or you're going to have to hope there's been some more rainfall. Otherwise, again, your productivity will drop to half of its potential. Okay, we've broken it. Hands up if anyone has another clicker. No, nah, I didn't think so. Okay. It's only a battery, unless there's another one. No. Oh, I'm up. Okay. Um, did I miss any slides while I was down on the floor? Okay. So let's have a look now. We know the tree water use has been impacted by the dry soils. Right, We know the tree can respond to the rainfall, but only for a short period. Okay, so I'm going to get up here and do this. So the data I just showed you of the tree responding is this little rainfall event here. Right, Quite quickly, the soil moisture runs out. And that's probably quite a typical pattern for the seasons you have. You have the short rains, get back. Okay, you have the short rains, it's almost burning up the soil. Okay, then a long dry period. Oh, that's a new one. Yeah. And then the long rains keep it wet enough so that probably in this case you don't need your irrigation from April, May, June, but you certainly need it between January and February, March. Right? In this particular situation. Um, yeah. oh geez where's the point of it okay I'm sorry about this I'm a novice first time doing it oh okay I've got it and then down the bottom is the lazy okay no nah, totally trained now what am I pointing at so there's the soil moisture the interesting thing about this one I said that the tree ran out of water Within a week, I've got soil moisture at three different depths. The black line are the surface roots, 30 centimeters. So that big rainfall, 45 millimeters in one day, didn't even get into the soil more than 30 centimeters, right? And you can see the rest of the root zone, boop, flat line. It's dry. Whatever rain occurred, and there wasn't much, actually didn't get in, didn't wet up the root zone. Didn't get to 30 centimeters, didn't get to 70 centimeters. But then the these rains come, boom, one, two, three big rainfall events. And then the whole of the root zone has been wet down to a meter, right? And then you see lots of root up ac take activity in the surface roots and even deeper down, down to 60, 70, even a meter deep 
those, uh, I was going to say olive trees, avocado trees are taking up water, right? So there's a lot of storage in the root zone that the trees can access for soil moisture. Okay, now I'm a computer modeler, so I need to de derive as much information from my data as I can. So I've shown you two graphs here that are seriously good ones, right? The first one is three years of soil moisture, or a year and a half maybe of soil moisture. And you can see how dy dynamic it is. Enough moisture in the root zone, and then, oh, it's drying out again. So you're starting to struggle a little bit with the soil moisture for a short period. Okay, and then through comes the rain the next year and so on. So the soil moisture is quite dynamic over the season. We have now plotted our tree water use versus our regional ET, our regional climate. So what's happening is these trees are growing and they're getting water stressed. They're growing and they're getting water stressed and they're growing and they're getting water stressed. So there's a general growth. So for every unit of evaporation, these trees are getting bigger and so they're using more water. So from my science, I've got to pull out that little relationship that I can pass on to you. The relationship saying, if I have a tree of a certain size, how much water does it use over the whole season? All right. Also, the second relationship we pull, pull out of the data is the relationship between soil moisture and tree water use. And I've redrawn it here. And this, this axis here is how much water is in the root zone right and then this axis here is what is the productivity of the tree okay and it tells us in this soil as long as we kept the soil moisture around this level the productivity would be optimized in terms of water right but as soon as the root zone dries out beyond below this point you start to get a bit of water stress we can measure it we've measured it in the tree and you can see the tipping point where your productivity will be impacted. So this is a really, really important piece of information to help us when we're giving some guidance on irrigation. We can tell you how much, and we can tell you when. When you need to turn on the irrigation, when you need to turn on the tap, on the basis of what we see in the soil on the basis of what we see in the climate in terms of the evapotranspiration. So it tells us over these normal periods of growth, you do get water stress. You know you get water stress. You've seen the trees getting a little bit limp and then the rains come and they rehydrate, they reinvigorate, and then they start on with their productivity. The thing about water stress is your fruit growth, as soon as you get water stress, the fruit will shrink a little bit or they won't grow as much and they never catch up. So if you want to produce small fruit, you'll, well, so you, if you have water stress, you will produce small fruit. Small fruit, weigh less, produce less oil, you farmer gets less money, right? So irrigation again has this positive benefit. So I now just show you a little short period that, I need to take my understanding of the water use of the trees over the season and rescale them so I can have one rule of thumb for you. So I can say a tree of this size will use this much water. And my scalar is something simple that everyone can measure and that is the trunk cross-sectional area. So if you have a tree and you measure its trunk circumference, I can tell you the water use any day of the year, okay? all other th factors being equal. So that's pretty powerful. And here's, here's how the scaling works. Okay, it's not perfect, but every tree is not perfect. But you can see it, it falls in a general line. So if there's no water stress, the trees use a certain amount of water. Okay, a certain amount of water per unit trunk size or per unit leaf canopy size. And so with our work, we're trying to work out how we can rescale the data to, to put some information into our computer model. All right. Oh, yeah. So 
I now need to come up with a simple rule of thumb of how big a tree is. I know every farmer, and you can put your hands, put every farmer put their hands up. Yeah, oh no, okay, everyone can put their hands up. How many of you can tell me the leaf area of the tree? No, no, keep your hands up. Okay, if you know the leaf area of the tree, leave your hand up. Everyone else puts their hand down, right? How many of you can tell me the age of the tree when you planted it? Ah, oh, that's lie. You all know when you planted it. Okay, everyone's hands up. So our model, for some reason it's gone off, but our model was going to give you some advice based on how old the tree is and what variety is. Mr. Um, can you fix it? I can see it over there. I can definitely see it over there. I'll work on that one without my glasses. Something went wrong. Okay, so I need to know how big a tree is and we have some fancy gadgets that we like to do. Across the schematic over there, I've got the top three pictures. On the left is Bridget measuring the trunk circumference. Oh, there we go. In the middle is Bridget. We use Bridget a lot. Bridget is helping record the height of the trees. I want to know how big the trees are for a certain age. And then I come along with some fancy gadgets and I take what's called a fisheye photo. And I look upwards and I say, how big is the leaf area? Right? The camera will tell me because the camera does not lie. Right? So this is technology that we use and a lot of forestry people use to assess how productive a forest is. And so we're just using the same technology here. Simple, it's on your cell phone. I can tell you, anyone interested, I can tell you what the phone app is. Um, and then we do, for really big trees, we're trying to estimate how high the tree is, how big the canopy is, so I can get an idea of uh, its water use and scale it. So if you have a 10-year-old tree, I can tell you how much water it's gonna use. Um, but there's other things that tree water use might or does depend on. I'm going to tell you how tree size and leaf area and microclimate and soil water availability affects the water use of the trees. But then there's other factors such as crop load, tree health, you know, biennial bearing, whatever that might or and management. If you cut the tree right down, we're going to have to have some different rules of thumb. But um, Anyway, first thing, we go out there with a ruler. Simplest tool, everyone can do it. And I say, trees of this age, across 60 or so trees, we, we visited seven farms. We chose seven or eight trees on each one of different ages. And we get a little relationship, tree age and height, tree age and width. And so I know a tree of this size is this big, right, in general. So we use simple allometric relationships to discover how big the trees are here. We then take that, those relationships and I want to know how big the leaf area is. So if I measure the trunk cross section, again with a ruler, then I now have a simple and pretty good relationship that says that's how big the, the tree is, All right? So the thing about tree water use, it's the climate, the leaf area, the soil water availability, they all interact to, to determine the water use of the trees, to determine how much irrigation, well, I don't think so, how much irrigation you need. You gave me 35 minutes in the program. Okay, well, I'm just gonna keep talking. Oh, bloody, you gotta allow for clicker time. Look, I'm clicking and nothing's happening. Okay, there's my fish eye thing. Um, and so I need to now go from a canopy, a tree size to a leaf area. Because once I know the leaf area and the climate, I can tell you exactly the water use of the trees. And so we've got some little functional relationships that tell me, first of all, how much light does that tree intercept? And secondly, how many leaves are on that tree? A general tree, but we've got 60 of them. And now we've scaled them back. Uh, uh, and, and we now know how big the trees are here. Right, And then we need to know if I plant the trees in the soil at a particular spacing, 
what does what is the relationship between the tree water use and the evaporative demand? How does that change as the trees get bigger or as you plant them from a wide spacing to a narrow spacing? Okay, so that's the basis of the model in there. You tell me your tree age, boom, and what spacing you've got, and I'll tell you its water use. Its water use will be this crop factor multiplied by the climate. So it's we've taken a lot of science and dumbed it down into a real simple rule of thumb. All right. Oops, push the wrong button again. So what does the tool look like? Everyone likes maps. I was talking before. Everyone likes to see the data. I might want to use this information to see where I should plant trees in Kenya. Right. So I've managed to access for you guys a database that gives you every village in Kenya. Okay. But I've just selected the ones we're interested in that grow avocados, and that's from the highlands okay. and through to the Western region. And with this tool, I'm a grower and I grow, um, I, I, I'm in car, uh, whatever that is. I can't read it without my glasses, but it's in Maranga. There it is, this little red dot on the map. Okay, and with a pull down menu, I can select any village in the country, which pulls in a soil database and it pulls in a climate database, right? The soil, the climate comes from um, a, a satellite derived um, estimate that aren't freely accessible, but you can get hold of, but we've assembled a hundred climate stations across Kenya for you. Okay, we've also got the soils of Kenya on a 5K grid. And in that soil database, it gives us properties we need to determine the irrigation. And the main property is the total available water that's in the soil. And it's got depth wise properties to tell you how wet the soil gets and how dry it will get. Okay, so lots of good information in the soil database. We've got waiting. Okay, so the first thing I want to know for my village, how do you say that village name? Kangema. Okay, in Kangema. Okay, roughly it gets on average 1100 millimeters of rain a year. And the evapotranspiration is, so this is what's going into the soil, that's what's coming out. On balance, you wouldn't think they'd need much um, irrigation, but they do, because here and here, you've got drought, okay? So the challenge is how much water do you need for your trees? Okay, so we have, this is the only page you need in the tool and you say, I am a grower, in this, this location. I'm growing three-year-old trees. How much water do I need for irrigation? And so we've we plotted something that says, well, here is the tree water use each month, the green line. Here is the, what I'm calling a reliable rainfall. So three out of four years, you're gonna get at least this much rainfall. And the difference between the two will be what we are saying is a reasonable, oh, we've lost the bottom line, but what, how much water you should allow for your trees, um, in this case, each month. But we've got the tool also gives similar data on a weekly and a daily basis. So you could say in January, for example, in January, um, these trees, I don't know how old the trees were in the example, but each tree needs uh, 30 litres of irrigation a day. Okay, so you get in your mind, I've got a five-year-old tree or whatever age tree this was. You need to, in January to have this much water, but perhaps in May and June, April and May, because it's rained, you don't need to have irrigation then, but this is now progressively more irrigation through the season until the rains come back. So we've got real practical numbers for you that should um, help with or, or assist you with your irrigation management. Um, in terms of litres a day. And, okay, key points on soil water. We recognise most, in most, most of the growing areas for the avocados, there's two periods of drought. Um, you've got short rains, and that's during flowering, so you want to keep soil moisture available so that you don't restrict the productivity of the trees. And then later in the season, you've got the long rains, and that's when the fruit are filling up. Right? And these droughts, we know, 
what we showed you, will affect the productivity and the fruit yield. So the actions you can take, some form of irrigation, we do advise, obviously, because even when you're establishing your trees, you've seen the survive, survival rates are pretty low um, if you don't irrigate. <coughs> um, we hope, hoping that the simple tool, water balance and some rain gauges, they'll enable you to um, manage your irrigation when the drought does come. And um, certainly this tool is one step towards your irrigation management and it'll provide useful and practical and defendable um, um, values for irrigation needs. Defendable is important when we start to get market access and we talk about sustainability. So we're gonna start working towards, um, or providing this tool for you so you can manage your irrigation better. Thank you. Next speaker does not have a speaker. Thanks, Steve. Well, despite breaking two pointers during that presentation, I think it was probably worth it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to digest there for everyone, but um, Steve is around for the next two days. So if you do have further questions beyond the panel and um, please do chase him down and he's always willing to talk about models and particularly related to soil water, but I matter also, which will be tomorrow. So come back tomorrow. Hopefully you won't break any more pointers tomorrow. We'll run out. So next up on the program, we will change tact a little bit and um, go into more of the biodiversity and genetic side of things. So genetic conservation. I'd um, like to introduce and welcome Dr. Desterio Nyamongo um, to present to us on biodiversity and genetic conservation of sustainable avocado growing systems. Uh, Dr. Nyamongo is a senior principal research scientist and an alumni of several universities of Nairobi, Birmingham, and Messina. He is the director of Genetic Resources Research Institute, Jerry, which is one of the 16 constituent institutes in, uh, of Cairo. And as such, he's on um, several uh, national and international committees and working groups at a senior level. So he's a man in the know and we're very lucky to have him here today. Um, and he's obviously published extensively also. So not difficult to find any of these scientists work online, I think. And we will, um, I should just mention, we will have these presentations for the two days available, probably with a Google Drive link access for a, a interim period of time. We do hope uh, in the future to have a repository of information from this CAS project available publicly. We are just uh, sorting that out. So meanwhile, hopefully there'll be a Google Drive uh, link available after the workshop, so you'll be able to access and download the presentations. Thank you, Dr. Desterio. I hope I do. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a worried man because we have green gold. What happens when there's green gold? Everybody goes chasing that gold, mining the gold, biodiversity servers. I'm here to plead with you that. Uh, let us not uh, 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 drive biodiversity to extinction because we will follow. We are part of that diversity. So you drive it out of the planet, you will also go. I, th I think we have already heard about that. Uh, uh, where the avocado came from, from South Africa, South America, South, South and Central America. So breeders who are in the house, you know where you, uh, 
you're supposed to go and guess your jump plasm from to build resistance for city fight of terror. But I was told, uh, fight of terror, we are supposed to keep it out of our farms. We ensure, we ensure that it doesn't come in. Uh, that's likely to be the center of diversity. That's where we are likely to get uh, uh, wild relatives of avocado. So when you want to mine genes that can assist you in the breeding program, perhaps that's the, the place to go to. Now, the, the I think we have also been told that there are about three, there are three races. Uh, originating from Guatemala, Mexico, and the West Indies. Now, we have also been told uh, uh, since the beginning, since this morning, uh, how much uh, production is, is happening in the country. I'm told the country has already uh, 40 varieties. At Calro, we are conserving about uh, 37, 39. 38 around there, uh, different varieties. We have been told which are the, the beautiful uh, varieties in the house. Uh, and these are the ones that are likely to drive out the, uh, the biodiversity because farmers will grow what gives him or her returns. So in the process, those weird looking varieties in the farm will be cleared and therefore disappear from the uh, the ecosystem the, the farming ecosystem we also by now must have known that uh, uh, there are different altitudinal requirements for different varieties and those are the ones that i've tried to give there Now, why avocado? Uh, I'm sure so. I came a bit late. Someone must have addressed this. Uh, but when I Googled, <laughs> I was told that uh, if you want to have a health uh, heart, I don't know whether that is true. Google, that is what Google was telling me. Then uh, you, you need to make avocado your friend. Uh, because of the oils it has that uh, works on the uh, bad oil, the, cholesterol, the bad cholesterol in our bodies. It's full of nutrients. Uh, it ensures uh, a healthy heart. Uh, it has beta carotene, which will improve the vision. I'm told it, uh, it also ensures bone health very good things about avocado and I, I suspect that's why uh, the consumption is increasing which is a good thing now if consumption is increasing i was confused a little bit when they said another speaker said we have almost there and um, the supply is becoming too much now how how does the supply come become too much when kenyans we are just starting and I come from a county that is known for avocado. So I will say, you check my head, I'm about to go there. That's where I was going to take my investments. Now you're telling me the market is already flooded, it is disappointed. But again, uh, there, there are very many applications for avocado. So uh, I, I think we still have a chance. Now, I, then I start uh, addressing myself to the, the topic that I was given, why, we, why biodiversity? Now, biodiversity ensures production resilience. Uh, Anton was here uh, and they said a lot of things about soil fertility, what the many nutrients that uh, we are going to need to effectively produce avocado. Now, those nutrients do not just come there. There are microbes that work on uh, 
on different rocks on on different matter to generate th those nutrients that's part of the mm -hmm. the biodiversity i asked in the morning why why abortion of fruits i'm told <laughs> you do not have pollinators those uh, those fruits are not going to survive they, they will come down you require the pollinators now if you only have a un one monocrop uniform field of avocado and they are not in flower. Where will those uh, pollinators be uh, foraging? So uh, farmers, as we clear, clean our farms to plant hers, you will not get the money unless you have taken care of the pollinators. To pollinate your uh, your house so that you have fruits otherwise all of them will fall mm -hmm. uh, biodiversity is essential for nutrient recycling uh, eco, uh, ecological sustainability as living organisms on our mother planet we are all interdependent everybody here is busy breathing that that oxygen that you are taking in has been uh, been generated by plants. So we are heavily dependent. If we clear out the plants, do we do we foresee a situation where all the plants go down and then we don't have uh, oxygen to breathe? Then what becomes about us? Well, seriously interdependent food and nutrition security and environmental quality. Over lunch time, uh, we were discussing about wetlands. What do not create wetlands so that money comes in and drain it? Actually, in the Ministry of Agriculture, I don't know whether it is still there. There is a whole department of irrigation and drainage. Drainage, to clear the wetlands so that we avail the land for, for food production. Wetlands are sponges that absorb excess water during the rains when the soil cannot take any more water. So the runoff goes and settle in those wetlands. And then during the dry spell, my friend, uh, has been talking up here about the water and we are so worried why we are missing that water is because we are messing up the environment. That water in the wetlands then comes out, is released to recharge the water table so that your rivers, uh, your, your river levels are maintained. And yet we are there basically uh, draining the wetlands. And when our boreholes dry up, we start asking ourselves, where is the water? When uh, families are swept down uh, by, by runoffs, we don't remember that it is us who have cle cleared the, uh, the hilltops and, and cleared the, the wetlands. When vehicles are swept over the bridges, it's because that all that water is moving to the, uh, to the seas and the lakes. Uh, there are no wetlands where some of it should, uh, uh, should rest. So what then, what do we need to do is to enhance the biodiversity. While we are promoting production, we should go in with technologies that ensure that we don't clear our biodiversity. Uh, we are here promoting uh, intercropping, and for those who are practicing uh, large-scale farming, you can uh, practice strip, uh, strip farming, where you leave strips of natural vegetation where those pollinators and other useful insects will hide as uh, uh, you open up the rest of your land. For we, we need to promote those technologies that ensure that we do not uh, erode our biodiversity.
the vision to go. I'll propose some of the, uh, the options that you have in terms of enhancing that biodiversity. Now, the best practice could to know which are the native species in, in the area where you are, you are opening up for any crop for that matter, not necessarily avocado. What are the native uh, species that you will want to intercrop? So that because those are the, those are the species that provide uh, uh, habitats or forages, forage for the useful insects, including the pollinators that you will need uh, in your farm for high production. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyamongo. And you have actually caught us up on a bit of time here, which is good news. So we'll be able to get you home eventually. Um, our final and very much not least uh, or last speaker in terms of uh, impact is Dr. Lasiki Wasilwa. I think she needs not much further introduction. Um, Lasiki brings so much energy and passion into everything she does, as probably been obvious since uh, she's stepped up forward this first thing this morning. So I think you can see into her work, the passion and energy that goes into agriculture and particularly avocados. It is a great love of hers. So very much looking forward to her presentation this afternoon. Um, and after Lasiki's presentation, we will move to the panel session where we'll get a lot more interactive. So thank you, Lasiki. I was wondering, what is that? It was my first slide. Apparently, I have control. Nyamongo saved me the time that we may need to talk. Um, so I'll just generally follow this outline, but you won't remember when I continue. But we've been told today, Nyamongo also mentioned it, avocado is the green gold. In the morning, I told you we're number one in Africa. I didn't mention number six in the world. So Kenya is doing extremely well. It is the green gold, but we must plant it without affecting, negatively affecting the biodiversity. So when you look at um, why I was given this uh, title to give, when you look at the area harvested and avocado from the 1960s, it has generally increased and you can see that, can't you? there's been this general increase in avocado production. When you look at the production, the tonnage, you see it's also, these two are mirror in each other. They're also increasing. This is data from FAO, so you don't think that Calro was trying to cook it. But what is alarming is you look at the yield, the kilograms per hectare. What do you see farmers? It has flatlined. Whatever we produced in the 60s is the same amount that we're producing now. There were a few odd years, I think that was a mistake by HCD, but it has flatlined. So when it flatlines like this, then what, what is it? What are we doing? What is Calro doing that is tasked? What is plant and food research doing? This research organization, academia, what are we doing? So when you look at the issues of import and export, this one you were told in the morning, I won't go into so many details, but you can see we've been increasing in tonnage, the value has been going up, and that's why you find a lot of farmers very interested in avocado. So what about these avocado supply and production chains? Why do we need to look at them? We have to look at this crop in its totality. When we look at the input, what are those things that are affecting the farmers? Eh? Can you afford the inputs? 
issues of fertilizers, pesticides, seed or seedlings. Seed is the general word for seedlings. And getting these improved varieties of seedlings, making sure they're true to type. Farmers, are you getting them? The issues of pests and diseases, you've heard about them. They're really the ones that are contributing to the flat line of avocado production in Kenya. Why the, the amount produced per hectare has not gone up since the 60s. We have issues of policies. We now want you to follow 1758. How many of you know there was such a standard? And how are the policies working for you, the food and nutrition policy? When it comes to marketing, are you able to get your fruit to the market? Are you able to adhere? Are you getting the correct price? All of these things are affecting how a farmer now operates. When we are growing, uh, uh, Dr. Nyamongo talked about it, Dr. Eselaba, the issues of soil degradation, our soils are unhealthy. We've been growing crops on those soils since and we're not recharging the system. We're just mining out of the soil. We, then when we are able to afford the fertilizers, we don't put sufficient amounts, whether it's even farm yard manure. Nyamongo has said intercrop, plant those strips so that you already have the, uh, the, the bio uh, um, diversity you need where the pollinators can go and forage. And then also when you're doing that, practice some kind of a rotation. Then the issues of cost of labor or even the education of that labor to harvest those avocados at the right time. And then are we using mechanization? Many of these things come up. When we come to the production node, there are even more problems. You heard about the problems told to you by HCD in the morning. It's going to rain. We never know. We have been told it's going to rain a lot. Then the rain disappears for another seven seasons. Then whatever we're growing, we're having issues of pre and post harvest uh, uh, practices. We're not following them. We're not uh, at accepting or following, adopting the, the, the post harvest technologies that have been developed. Then when we are harvesting, do we follow food safety? We just drop the avocado and hope that the next person who eats it is able to wash the issue of knowledge. Do we have enough knowledge farmers? Do we have enough? I'm looking at you because I know you're a farmer. To be able to grow this crop, the pests and diseases, there are many. I'll come back and dwell on that in another slide. Then our land, it's getting smaller and smaller. As we go generation to generation, the land sizes have been divided to smaller and smaller. So now we have very small production units and these affect how um, um, avocado grows. So when we finally have the crop, are we just gonna eat a fresh crop or are we now going to value add it and have the juice we had for break or the salad that we ate or the fresh fruit we ate at lunchtime? How are we value adding? And when we do this, are we following all the standards that are in place for food handling and production? Are we packaging these crops properly? Are we doing this? The issue of land, how does it come in now again? Where are the farmers? Are they in one place? Before, 60% of our farmers were in Muranga, but now they're all over Kenya. So how does that then affect us? When we have all of this product, the avocados, how do we get it to the market? How do we package it? We throw it in sacks. But now we're saying, don't use sacks, use the crates. Then when you have the crates, put it in a refrigerated truck and then don't put it in an open pickup and that's what you always see. But we have issues that we can't control even after we've done all that correctly. Are the roads okay? Yeah. Do we have sufficient infrastructure for this avocado so that we can make sure whatever we're growing is getting to the market? Hmm? The cost of transport, the fuel has just been going up, up, up. Now it's what, 180, 170 shillings. How do the farmers afford that? And then our rail, it's only the one from Mombasa to Nairobi. We've not yet gone to all the other parts of the country. We need our rail system working. That's what will now make it cheap for the farmers. So when you look at the avocado value chain, it's an intricate, complicated system where whatever we're doing to the avocado, all we want to do is get that avocado into our stomachs. Mm. I just drank some avocado juice or sell it to put money in our pockets. Kavesha, it's sweet. Eh? If you're Kiku, you know what Kavesha means, more money for me. So how are we able to do this? When we are looking at, at um, avocado, when we come to consumption, before we get there, we look at, can we sell what we have? Do we have the information, the data that we need to know which markets will be giving us good prices? If I have a problem, like there's a thing called mosquito bug, we'll talk about it. How do you manage that uh, particular insects? 
Do you manage it with pesticides or do you use biological controls? You know, you're asking yourself. Then you go and buy like uh, the governor of uh, Transoya who planted 500 avocados. When they said bearing, he had planted jumbos. He chopped down all of his trees. So the issue of the seed systems and kepis is here and HCD are here. And then you grow and then everything comes the way we like avocado, even the pests and diseases are coming to eat. Then the issues of greenhouses. Some of these things we don't control, but our president has said we plant 15 billion trees and it's not a joke. When it comes to mechanization, Ernest, where are you? He's showing people how to harvest avocado using the harvesting bags. And then we package these things properly. But we're also trying to promote what Olivado is doing, the issues of value addition, where you can make oil and other products, even from the pit, where you can make um, um, some bio fertilizers. So when we look at avocado, my niece Jocelyn is asking, so Auntie Luzike, what is next? Now this is where the juice comes in. It's all about calorie, it's all about science, but I'll make sure the farmers don't get lost because I'm not that clever. So don't worry, don't panic. It's all about developing technologies, innovations, and management practices. This is the way that word in full. We just call them teams. Then you just know it's technology. Sindio, hmm? when it comes to production, what is there? Remember, I can't tell you everything. I'm only gonna tell you the few things that we're doing now that are gonna make a big difference in the avocado production systems. Now we've developed, if you go to the Calro stand, the first one that only had some funny avocado, you go back there now, there are posters that now link what we're trying to promote now, issues of biodiversity and where to grow avocado. When you look at this map, you have uh, a few dark, dark green, these ones, highly suitable. Then there's a, a lighter green, moderately suitable. Then the light green, uh, uh, marginally suitable. It shows where you can grow maca uh, at Makadim, avocado in Kenya, you know? So yes, I want to grow avocado, but don't go growing avocado in these places where there's no green. If you want to plant there, then you better have irrigation and you, you have now been taught how much a tree requires. You've been taught that, right? And you, how to take the measurements with the tree scale scalar. But when we're growing, Dr. Nyamongo said it's not just Haas and Fuete. In Kenya, we have many. This is the diversity of avocado from Kiboswa and Kisumu. There were 40 different types, and all of these are now going to our gene bank in uh, Thika. So when you add the, it was 45 plus 27, you see we're going on and we're still collecting from different places. So by the end of the year, Joseph Corey, Juguna behind there, will have over 100 avocado varieties. We're trying to conserve them. Hmm? We are trying to conserve these avocados. The world wants us as we want blue band, the big fat ones. And when you look at them, even the seeds are very diverse and we are going to conserve because at one point we'll need a gene of resistance or tolerance and it will come from these land races that we have in Kenya. And there are many. We have 27 varieties as told to you by Dr. Nyamongo. There are many. Uh, the ones that are green are also found in Grisbach's book of avocado uh, growing in Kenya. We have many, but right now, us has taken over where Fuerte was. But at one point, we were also exporting Pinkerton. You know, that is for export. But when it comes to growing avocado, for Kenya. As we want the jumbo from Kisi, these big fat things, they are big, this is a small one, they're even bigger. They are called blue band, they're good for bread, they're good for your health, they're good for your heart, as told by Dr. Nyamongo. How do we promote that jumbo? production in Kenya, so that it now contributes to the 15 billion trees of President Ruto's initiative to repopulate Kenya with trees. We have three major commercial varieties, I've mentioned them. The commonly used rootstocks are Puebla and, and uh, Fuerte. Somebody's asking a question. Now, when we start looking at what we're trying to promote in Kenya, we're trying to really conserve our biodiversity. 
There's an avocado variety, this one. This thing is about a foot long, that size. It's called Yuko Giant. Yuko Giant is around the corner here from Calro. I really wanted to get Yuko to come here so you can know it's actually named after him. It's big, it's got good, good for surface characteristics. Therefore, it doesn't smash. It takes a, a bit longer to ripen. It's fantastic for juice. If you drink the juice of Yuko Giant, you stop taking alcohol, I'm telling you. So you can imagine what will happen to your world life. Those are some of the products. Yeah, you stop alcohol. And it has other fringe benefits for men, particularly men. I wouldn't go down that route because this thing has been recorded. When it comes to propagation, this has been told to you. I'm telling you again, because this is the last present. I'm summarizing what you had earlier in the day. We have the commercial rootstocks, hmm? avocado rootstocks. This is propagation. We have several other rootstocks that are in Kenya and in our center in Karo Thika, Lula, Winter Mexico, Walden. We're still looking at them. But in the process of looking at them, we now knew that uh, Puebla was quite good, but it's not been taken over by Fuerte. But we also have G755, that is Toro and Phytoptera. These are the things we're looking at, and those are some of the products that will be coming out soon. So when you look at how you produce, I won't go into so much detail, but we have these nurseries and we're now promoting the high health. Don't buy an avocado seedling from the ground because you're just moving Phytophthora. Don't. And now we have huge nurseries with thousands and thousands of trees, Parachichi, our nursery in Sika, Karo seed and also HRI, they are huge, uh, Olivado, all grown using high health. The seedlings are not on the ground. And now of course, Kenyans, we now seem to like very big Sydney. This is in our center at Carlo Seed. This is at the Parachichi Center in Eldoret. Now, just to show you how tech Kenyans are, this is Parachichi Center, very tech. Eh? And this is uh, uh, Olibado EPZ. This is where it all began. This was the birth of high health in Kenya. High health was born in Olibado. And from there now we're rolling it out, we're growing our seedlings in Calro using high health, where now um, uh, three Calro researchers have been trained on how to assay the soil for Phytophthora. And then from there, we now go on to make sure that the soil that we're producing our seedlings is clean and has no Phytophthora root rot. So if you buy from Olivado, if you buy from Parachichi, if you buy from Calro, you've gotten the best quality, but you better come money, we don't wait for you. Our seedlings are in high demand and we're trying to produce as many as possible. So when you look at pests and diseases, I told you farmers, you'll be with me, I won't lose you. And I think you're enjoying the pictures. This is avocado, anthracnose, eh? anthracnose, coletot, now I have to torture you a bit, eh? coletoticum gliospoiroides. You thought Phytophthora was hard, how about coletoticum gliospoiroides? Very nice. We have so many diseases on avocado, but we, we are just showing you what we consider in Kenya, diseases of economic importance, things like Phytophthora, root rot, anthracnose, Sarcospora is a problem, scab, because of climate change is really becoming an issue. Avocado sun blotch virus, this is a new baby on the block, horrible. Fusarium and all of those, you get this uh, happening at the ends of your avocado when you harvest them. And this is a really big problem, particularly when it comes to trade. So how do we then harvest? When you harvest your avocado, you're told leave a little bit of the stem on top. Don't break it all the way to the bottom because then you're allowing these pathogens to get in and then cause these rusts as you're seeing here. If you want to know more about these diseases and pests, we actually have a full presentation that will take one hour on just them and how to control. I'm not gonna torture you on that. When it comes to pests, False codling moth is number one. We have the fruit flies that stopped trade of avocado from Kenya to South Africa from 2007 until 2017, 10 years. But we managed to finally get to how to treat our avocado and package them, and then we open our market. In that 10 years, South Africa shut down our market. They did not know Kenyans were moving. We were moving like um, the guy who ran the marathon in less than two hours. What's his name? Keep jogging. They didn't know we're just coming. 
You know, as we're long distance. By the time the market was open, Kenya was number one in Africa. South Africa just so dust. Yeah? But now we have other pests like flower beetles. They're beetles. They're just eating the flowers like they are mowing like a tractor. Those things are, and they're different kinds of beetles. So entomologist, Dr. Njoka, you need to do something about that. Eh? So that we're able to manage these things like fruit flies, we manage them biologically. We just use pheromones. False codly moth, we're still working on them with Kabi. Where is Mary Lucy? Orange, where are you? Mary Lucy is there. I wish you would have allowed her to see, show her presentation. She'll talk a lot more on this to be able to show you what we're doing in Kenya in managing pests and diseases. So there's one input that farmers never remember for avocado. Nobody ever talks about it, but it's an input called a pollinator, except Nyamongo. Nyamongo, you stole my presentation. Where is that guy? Stole my presentation, useless. Where was you know, I'm upset here. That is the number one input we forget about. He has told you to leave strips. Now, 75% of the crops on earth re rely on pollinators. 75. You kill the pollinators and in four years, there'll be no mankind. You'll be dead, all of you. Because if you don't have pollinators in your avocado farm, you have lost 64.5% of the potential yield. Now, let me put it the way Kenyans understand. You are going to get 100 billion. Now you have taken 64.5 billion and thrown it in the dustbin. Have you understood now? Muna tuba tu pesa kwa dustbin. 64.5 billion metupa because you didn't have a pollinator. Yeah? And then you wonder, oh, I saw my trees flowering. Eh, 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 where, where were the fruits? They all fell. No pollination happened. 97%. That is horrible. Then you say 6%, Nini, he only 6 billion out of 100. 6%, 6 billion. How many children can go to school? Mukulim. Eh? You don't even want that one going in terms of the fruit weight. Then when you have good pollination, you might realize the 92% yield increase. Therefore, the production that has flatlined will start going up with the, the hectareage and the tonnage just by pollinators, whether they're the stingless bees. The honeybee is still in the pollen. It's a stingless bee that pollinates uh, um, avocado. Mm? And then the average yield loss, just generally, is 25%. If you have good pollination, something else will get you because farmers always miss some things. So don't forget the pollinators. They are very, very important. Issues of post-harvest, you, you'll be told a lot of this tomorrow, but I'm just giving you a bit, just the big numbers. We lose an average of 40 to 45% from post-harvest losses. When we don't package our avocado in crates and the way we harvest them, we leave them in the sun and then we don't even put them in a cold, a chain system. When we do that, we're losing all of that. So we need to put these crates in and stop using sacks for packaging. This one is here today. Tomorrow you'll get, this is the appetizer. The main meal will be tomorrow the whole day. So I'm not going to spoil it for the person coming tomorrow so that you can pay attention. When it comes to multiple uses, today, if you had never drank avocado juice, you drank it at, at 10 o'clock. What you have not seen is the avocado oil, but this is olivado. And we have to thank Gary for that. Thank you so much for putting Kenya on the map and making sure that we are fast. Thank you, Gary. Wave at them so they know this tall white guy. Me, I'm turning white, actually. It's either Bob or Gary. Eh? You Africans, to hell with you, you're boring. Then how do we then eat avocado? Now we have guacamole. Eh? Eat guacamole, apachini. See, you eat that and kachumbari avocado. We call it kachumbari, but it's guacamole, or we just slice it like today we had at lunchtime. Or, oh, my goodness, you eat avocado in a burger. Oh, man. Oh, oh, oh. That's what I'm eating for supper today. You go to a restaurant called CJ's, it will serve you this thing. It's a monster. You can only eat half. Those are the things we want to do. How do we value add? How do we value add so that Kenya increases production and productivity? How do we do that? We can't do it without our partners. And we have our partners, Pocalro, Plant and Food Research, Olivado, Horticulture Crops Directorate, KEPIS, National Museums of Kenya for the Pollinators, FAO for Pollinators, 
and CAFIS, of course, it's all run by the issues of pests and diseases. So that we can continue doing this, the increase from 1960, 80, 2000, 20, look at that jump. Can you imagine what this thing will look like in 2030? How much we will be producing? Then you come here. I didn't take the one of yields by acre because we have agreed it as flat line. Here, 16, 20, 322,556. Wakulima, Asante, you've done well. Even if they're saying farmers don't know, no, no, no. This was done by farmers. So we are now asking, the president has said that we need to plant 15 billion trees. How many of those billion trees up to 2027 will be avocado? So I'm hoping the New Zealand government continues to fund this project another 10 years. If they do that, if you do that, we will know what New Zealand has done for avocado production. You got us somewhere, appetizer. You gave us main meal, we got there, we're there now. But the sky is the limit for Kenya. And we need more guys to come here to create more jobs for our youth and create uh, more impact, positive impact on the environment of Kenya. So we're asking you, New Zealand, give us more money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lusiki. Always a pleasure and always a, uh, very entertaining. If anyone was sleepy, hopefully they're awake now. We need to please arrange the stage now for a panel quickly. Um, I would beg of you. Yes, we have all the speakers from this session joining us. And uh, two more guests, uh, Mary Lucy Orange and, um, and uh, Catherine Ebos from Ebos Farms. So I know you haven't had afternoon tea or a break and you've been sitting a long time. Uh, the idea is that we will do this panel session and then let you go home at your leisure. So there will be a cup of tea and, um, sorry, I was too close to the microphone, <laughs> cup of tea and afternoon tea, evening tea on your way out. So you're not going home hungry. Some of you might have a bit of a long uh, commute, but in order to keep you all together, we're going to do this panel session now for John and, uh, and then have that, that break on the way out and you can all continue to chat if you wish and, and go home at your leisure. So bear with us. This, uh, this won't disappoint, but uh, we really want your input and engagement in this last session this afternoon. I know it's been a long day, so I would ask you all for a minute to just stand up and give me a good canyon dance. Can we do a canyon dance? Who can dance for me? I certainly can't. Oh, and the clap. Lusiki, we need a clap. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> we need to do your clap and a bit of a dance and a stretch. <laughs> yes, please, come up here. Please, Lusiki, get everyone up for a minute. And could the other panellists please take the stage whilst you're clapping and dancing? Okay, now we'll move from Moi to factorial. You know, Moi liked education. So we'll start with the five factorial, one, two, three, four, five. Then you go to one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, and then one, and you point at whoever you like. Okay, five factorial, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two. Ah, ah, to find your tenor. Who are these people clapping all through? You count. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, one. Uh -uh, one more time. You need to follow. I don't want to hear people clapping off. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, one. Now you got it, finally. Three times.
expecting these seats to be more comfortable. Water? Yes. Dan, don't worry, I've been sitting all day. Thank you, everybody. That was a quick turnaround. And thank you, Lusiki, for leading us there, waking everyone up. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Right. So just to introduce our two extra panelists that have now joined us um, a little bit further, we have uh, down on the far, my far left, uh, Mary Lucy Oranger, who is an entomologist uh, from CABI. She's a specialist in crop protection, sanitary, and phytosanitary. And uh, interestingly, she is the lead technical advisor on the latest avocado good practice guide that um, has just been launched. And you'll hear more about that soon. Yes. So uh, really lucky to have Mary Lucy here with us today. And we appreciate your, your input into this panel this afternoon. Um, and right here, I have Catherine Evos from Evos Farm. Um, and uh, Catherine is the owner of Evos Farms based at Cambiti in Maranga County. Many of you probably know Catherine. She's been producing avocados for five years, but has worked very closely with Olivado and this project during that time. And we really appreciate your support over the life of the project, Catherine, and we thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's great to have a producer voice on our, on our panel. And as the, as the moderator for this panel this afternoon, I get the privilege of asking the first question, and then we will take questions from the floor. And hopefully we're able to take a couple from online as well, if someone can coordinate that for me. Um, what I wanted to make note of is that two weeks ago, the European Parliament actually voted to pass regulatory law to ban greenwashing of consumers. So what does this mean for us? It means that companies will not be able to sell products into the EU market, making claims like sustainable, biodegradable, eco-friendly, etc., without certified standard backup verified to EU standards. So we're seeing this growing consumer voice wanting more access to traceability, to verification, to knowing the carbon footprint of what they're eating and buying. And life cycle assessment is more and more a buzz phrase. So my question, first question to the panel this afternoon, and you can answer at will, whoever wants to jump forward first, please do, is how do you see Kenya participating in this market? We're getting more and more stringent from the EU, which is obviously a goal market. How do you see Kenya in this place? Thank you. Uh, actually, the green, EU Green Deal poses a very uh, a challenge to us, to Kenya, especially on the sustainability angle. And uh, in this regard, I want to mention just a few. Uh, for instance, uh, the EU Green Deal uh, recommends a reduction in use of inorganic inputs, like for instance, pesticides. But what does that mean for our pest control? For instance, we have to find alternative, especially more organic based. We are talking of biopesticides. We are talking of semi or semi the pheromone traps. Uh, in response to the uh, presentation we had, for instance, for FCM and other pests. Also, the EU deal by the 2030 will have to reduce more reliance on, on uh, the other uh, forms of energy like the fuel. So, alternative sources, we are talking about use of renewable energy like the uh, uh, solar panels, for instance, in our production value chain. So we have to uh, uh, custom to that. EU is one of our biggest markets, and therefore 
to sustain that market, we have to align our practices on the EU deal. The other is on the shipping, more sea freight and no, uh, less air freight. Uh, this is in response to the greenhouse gases. So we have to align our uh, shipping more. I think there are a number of uh, uh, supporting agencies supporting that so that we align to those, uh, the EU deal requirements on the points that I've mentioned, but there are some others as well. Thank you, Mary Lucy. I think you've answered that beautifully. And just to note at lunch, it was really heartening to hear from a young lady that um, is in Maranga County uh, raising biocontrol agents, or actually egg parasitoids uh, for lepidopterans. So mainly aimed at uh, your lepidopterans, including of course, fall armyworms. So into those maize and legume and vegetable crops, not so much avocado, but it's fabulous to have that integrated pest management in our midst and in the rural community, not just the cities. And I hope that we are seeing more of that come into Kenya and be strengthened and promoted. Yeah. Um, do we have questions from the floor? And did anyone else want to comment on that before we move on? Question. I think we have a, la a lady at the back, do we? Okay, thanks a lot. My name is Nick. When we think of the organic but rice, I think we use it when it is not treated. So is there a way, do we have any way we can sterilize it before using it for planting or planting? About the organic organic fertilizer like the cow dung and whatever. Is it safe to use it without sterilizing it? Is it safe to use it without sterilizing? Without sterilizing. I think it's trying to say that they need to sterilize fertilizer, organic fertilizer before use. If you sterilize fertilizer, you'll definitely destroy some of the, the, the nutrients in them. Normally, it's safe to use fertilizer if properly managed and properly stored without contamination. I'm talking of organic, not inorganic, isn't it? What we normally sterilize is the soil. We get rid of certain uh, pests, disease, and other things, but not the organic fertilizer. You know, when you're going to use the organic fertilizer farmyard manure, you have to usually make sure it is well decomposed. It has to be well decomposed. You don't just take the raw and put it on the crops because you'll burn them. When the nitrogen is changing into the usable form that the plant can now use, it will use a lot of what should have gone to the plant and therefore deny your plant those different... Um, uh, nutrients. So you have to make sure it's well decomposed. So when it's the, at that stage, it's okay. We don't sterilize. No. Thank you. Thank you. So we also recommend some good practices for uh, the production of manure for use. So well decomposed. Uh, Dr. Lusika has mentioned this. But remember that your manure can also get uh, 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 infected by, let's say, Phytophthora from Rano. So wherever you are uh, having your manure must be protected uh, from runoff, and therefore not just putting unaweka to purple in jail, you pro, uh, throw in a few things there. It should be well protected from things like runoff, but uh, the, the best practice use well decomposed manure. Thank you, everyone. Another question from the floor? Dave Priest, we've got another one over here. Thank you. I, I love the presentations um, and the reminder on uh, pollinators and water. I, I have a simple question for, for two of you. Um, if I'm a farmer in Western Kenya or somewhere else, what's the simplest thing I can do 
um, to attract the pollinators which are going to help me? What's the, the easiest plants or whatever it is that I can have? And how much benefit might I see within a couple of years as a result of that? This is the first question. And then the related one is with water. If I don't have a dam, I don't have a big irrigation system, I have a limited amount of water that I can feed my 30 trees. How should I best use that water? When is the best time to use it? Is it in a slowly, slowly every day in the middle of the, dry, the driest season or spreading it somehow or all at once, once a week? What's the best way I can use the limited water I have? Thank you. Dr. Desterio, do you want to lead off on the pollinators? It's on, it was, so, yeah. Thank you for that question. One of the simplest things that you may want to do, say along the hedges or the terraces, allow growth of herbaceous vegetation, the flowering, the flowering plants that uh, the, 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 the pollinators will keep on foraging on, even when your crop is not in flower so that they are, they are kept around as uh, you are waiting for your crop to flower and then uh, that field will be full of pollinators. Now, sometimes you are, you must spray. We, we recommend that you, you spray uh, late in the evening when most of the pollinators are not active so that they are also not, uh, if you must spray, they, they do not uh, affect the pollinators during the, the active time of the, the day. You don't you, you don't spray your crop when uh, the pollinators are very active in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Would you give us a personal experience from the farm? <laughs> yes. Um, my farm is in Makuyu, and that area is very hot. So we try our best to keep weeds alive as much as possible because weeds have a lot of flowers, different flowers. The brighter the flowers, the better. There's a, there's a, there's a weed we call, I'll use my native language, it's called maroro. I don't know if you know that weed. Maroro, python or something. Yeah, yeah, that one. We keep, we keep it literally protected. We put it up uh, so that it, it allows for the bees to come in. We also protect if you have old trees, especially the indigenous trees, don't bring them down no matter what. <clears throat> Make sure that uh, if you have those indigenous trees, protect them because they, they attract the bees a lot. In fact, in holes, we find the bees in holes. So when the, the time for flowering comes, we have a lot of bees in our face, but we realize it's because mostly because we have a lot of uh, that, that foliage, which has got bright, bright, bright flowers. Those bright flowers, don't think it's all weed. And then don't burn things on the farm. When you burn things in the farm, you might be burning stuff which the, uh, the bees need a lot because we really need to protect our bees. About the water, I think you have to understand the avocado tree is like a, a child. It's like a human being. You need water regularly, not a lot, but regular. So, okay, in my place, I've tried to put catchment areas because it's a very hot area. So I try and put holes where they, they, they're gonna be water no matter what. So it's, except, except for this time we had a lot of rain, most of the time we don't have a lot of rain. So we ensure that if you're gonna give water so much water, it is continuous. So we don't have something like the, the tree has too much water today, too little water tomorrow. It doesn't like those kind of um, uh, ex uh, excesses. Not, not too little, not too much. If you don't have much water, try and figure out how much you can kind of sustain with it. That's what I, that's how we do it now. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. I think you've answered that beautifully, both questions and hit the nail on the head with the biodiversity, keeping that native species and, and timber in there. And being, having been to your farm, it really strikes me as a place you walk through and it is so natural and beautiful. It's a, a thriving avocado farm uh, with great production, but at the same time, it's a beautiful natural habitat uh, within it and throughout it. So I think you've got that balance very nice. Does anyone else want to comment on the water question before we move on? Yes, I thought he might. Go, Steve. Well, 
I didn't want to, but I felt like I had to, um, seeing how I gave a presentation on um, irrigation. Um, one of the things you know is that the evaporation from the soil is wasted water. So if you have limited water, make sure you're doing the mulching to reduce the evaporation. The more soil surface that you wet, the more evaporation loss there is. So minimize the area that you wet. A tree doesn't have to have its whole root system wet in order to uh, benefit from the water you do supply. So supplying it over a smaller area, mulching to reduce the evaporation. Um, as Catherine said, pre, uh, a little bit often is better than a big dose and then waiting. Um, being able to store the water that would otherwise run away is um, also what was suggested. Capturing some of your roof water to expand your, your supply for the irrigation. Knowing how much water the trees use, hopefully that's going to be a benefit to you and using kind of the, the tools or a simple handout to provide some guidance. And, and, and that's what our project's aimed at doing. Um, and in the extreme case, um, perhaps reducing some of the leaf area of the trees. Um, yeah, all, all, all things. The critical period obviously is around the flowering um, and during the drought periods. So you'll, you'll know when you need it because you'll see the trees responding. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I think we had one over here. Yes. Thank you so much for the good presentations. My question goes to Dr. Nyamongo about biotechnology. What would be the role of biotechnology in addressing issues of food security and more so addressing issues of viruses that are affecting this great plant that we love. Number two, I love Dr. Lusike's presentation on putting children or young people at the front. I want to know how much or to what extent have you engaged schools, especially for learning and addressing food security? Thank you. Please. <laughs> I don't know why you direct the question to me on biotechnology. I'm a biodiversity person. I'm not a biotechnology guy. Uh, biotechnology, of course, has a role in terms of addressing our, our food security. But that's not to say that is the single bullet solve our, our, our food, uh, food issues. Be frank, there, there are very many biotechno, uh, bio, biotechnology tools that are not uh, uh, that, that are not injurious to the environment and to, uh, uh, to human health. Tissue culture, grafting, that, that, that those are technologies that uh, expedite. Uh, uh, production. Uh, you see the uh, marker assisted breeding cuts the period of, of a week to generate a new variety uh, 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 significantly. So th those are the technologies that we are promoting. Exter exterminate a gene is a very bad one. We, we, we should not even just start talking about it. So they are biotechnological tools that are, are uh, friendly and those should need to be promoted. So uh, those ones that are very bad, we should not even talk about them in the, in the room. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nyamongo. Uh, thanks, uh, Monjera, for asking that question about how do we put children up front. Um, sometime in June, we're going to have a competition for children. We want to know the biggest avocado in the country. Uh, that will be sent out by Calro and uh, we'll give the children who produce the first three biggest avocado because that's the only way we can get our 
or buy directly without having to go out there. It's cheaper for us because we'll get them coming to us and then we'll measure them and then put them in our gene bank in Thika. So the other thing is that if you go to the tents, there's uh, one of the tents, an exhibition that came a little bit later around lunchtime. It has the youth from the plant village. Plant village people, where are you? Oh, there, there, there. Those are my three new adopted babies. And what these kids are using is they're not, for me, they're kids anyway, me, I'm old. They're using um, uh, cell phones where they can photograph a pest or a disease. And then through all these, a few steps, it tells you what it is and what to do about it. Just go there and see. Farmers, don't miss. That way you will never have, have the wrong disease or pest on your crop, but it'll also teach you how to manage that pest and disease. So the plant village, they're sitting here now, but tomorrow and today, go and visit them. And that's how we're bringing in our youth. The other thing in the competition for the big fruit and then the plant village uh, kids who are here, the other one that we really want for children is later on, it's headed by one of our young uh, researchers, James Dambuki, and his mentor is here right now, Dr. Francis Wayua. And these guys are value adding. So we're hoping that uh, by the end of the year, we'll have a recipe book made by Kenyans, for Kenyans on avocado. And it will be so user friendly. And anybody who participates in that recipe book should be aged less than 35 years old. If you're above, so me, I'm out. <laughs> I would move myself. If you're about 35, we don't want to know. We want the youth because we want to know what do the youth like eating? We really want them to eat more of the avocado so that whatever we produce is not been eaten by birds, cats, or dogs. Thank you. Thanks, Lusiki and Dr. Desteria. We might just now uh, switch a little bit and take one question. We'll come back to you. Take a question from online. Um, if you could... Read it out down there, please. The question is to Dr. Steve. In modeling soil water requirement, you used soil data from a five kilometer grid. Is this, lowest, is this the lowest that would be accessed given the var var variability in soil characteristics within small areas? I think the question was something about soil variability and reliability of the data. I think, and to down to what level? They were saying five kilometer grid, were they? Oh, yes, no. So what but level, we, we, Steve? We could only use the data that we could access. And part of a workshop like this is to show you what we found. And if you have an alternative source, and this man here does, then we can use better soil data. Real data is always better than data that has been assumed from a soil map. So what I've put into our tool is data from a, a, a project in the 70s or 80s that was assessing soil carbon, and they developed from the one to one million scale maps, um, soil profile properties that we uh, could access and did access. So yes, if there's better data available, and trust me, I did search for it on the internet and this is all I could find, um, then we would appreciate seeing or, or accessing it and maybe morphing it into our tool to improve um, its reliability in soils where you might question the data um, from a larger scale map to a smaller scale um, real farm. Thanks, Steve. And if there's one thing I've learned about Steve and working with him over this project is he doesn't stop. He doesn't just say, right there, I've done it. He's always looking to optimize the model, increase the rigor, make it more applicable for the end user, which is um, most of you in the room, but particularly the producers here. I just said one more thing. We do the same sort of work with our growers in New Zealand, and we provide them with tools that if they dug a soil pit and did a textural analysis, then we can provide them with a better estimate of the soil properties. And that's a standard texture uh, method. We, we might provide a handout on how to do it, um, but you then need to link texture to soil properties. And that's where the soil guys need to provide us with that information. Mm. Um, yep. that that's the only way really, dig a real hole on a real farm and assess the properties locally. 
Yes, so these tools are always, you know, um, a broad interface, if you like, for if you need some information and you need it now and you can get a generalized idea of what you're looking at. But if you want to drill down right down to your farm, as Catherine might, then it is always best to, to look at how you can further increase the reliability of the model. And in this case, it's get in touch with Steve and get it down to farm level. And at this point, I would just like to uh, ask Anthony and Catherine, now that they've seen uh, Steve's model, a snapshot of it, a taste, uh, what you think of it. And uh, Anthony, probably from a soils and water perspective and, and Catherine from a, a user level, uh, how, how useful do you think? What do you think about the model? We'll start with Catherine and then Anthony, I'll hand over to you. Uh, how, now you've seen Steve's model presented, what do you think of it and the applicability of it? And maybe you can enlarge on the soils part of what, how you could collaborate there. Catherine? Yes. <clears throat> I think for, for a farmer, the model is very useful because um, sometimes we wonder if we put too much water, especially when you don't have enough. But if you are sure that this plant needs this much water because you have some sort of data you're using, I think it gives you some sort of, um, it qualifies for you to put so much water and not so, uh, not, not, not so much on something else. Like in my farm, I do uh, irrigation, drip irrigation, and it's computerized. So it would be very easy for me to, to put the data he's given us into the computer. And in one side of the farm, which has got trees, which are two years, it gives this much. And that side of the, uh, of the farm, which has got like five years, it gives this much and on and on. This way I, I rest in peace knowing that, wow, now that I've done this, I've done this and done this, I can get my avocado without the fear that I've done too much or too little. So sometimes when we have meetings in the office and the avocados are not doing too well, we, we don't, we're not sure why not. And that, that will save us time. It will also save us money, of course, and we are assured of our production. So yeah, I think having those kind of tools are important for the farmers. So I'm really excited. Okay, sorry. Uh, as I told you, I didn't want to speak uh, okay. uh, about water because I knew what it takes right from the time I was a student. Working on crop water requirements is not an easy tool or an easy subject and irrigation and drainage. So basically what I'm seeing is that uh, Steve has done a good job but we need updated data and information so that it's more relevant right now, covers more areas in the country. We don't have a full comprehensive soil survey map for Kenya that is updated, but we're working on that through the Kenya Fertilizer Network. Before I left Cairo, we had started the process with crop nuts. Crop nuts is the crop nutrition labs. Is there anybody from crop nuts here? Uh, Jeremy accordingly. They, they were not invited, is it? Yeah, but uh, Jeremy accordingly and the team, it's a private uh, lab. They have a lot of data on, on different soils and they're working with Calro and the Minister of Agriculture to update the soil, uh, the soil maps and soil characteristics. On small projects, we've done small site specific uh, data which we have and we can provide that would help update some of it. But the Kenya government needs to take this seriously because we have small projects we've done over the years, African Soil Information Service Project. We collected some data in Western Kenya. We have legacy data that is available. African Soil Information as the coordinator for, for Kenya. For you. Yes, so we have data that at now. It's actually available at now. Mm. We have data from Regreening Africa Project in Ikra. They also have a lot of data that can be used to update what he's doing. Um, what else? We, uh, we have ISRIC. We are now ISRIC. Before I left Calder, I was the coordinator for the Soils for Africa project. We had started analyzing soils. That's where we got the data. Yes, but this, that's very basic. They are still working on it. So you've got the old data mm -hmm. that we got for the government, Netherlands government in the 80s and 70s. And it has never been really updated. So, but you can see the kind of information we are getting. Maybe I can even tell you, we, we, some of the equipment he was showing, there was a soil moisture unit you were measuring in the field. We got one from Australia a few years ago. 
with the International Atomic Energy Agency. We established it in the field in Rakanidi to monitor uh, soil moisture in, uh, in, in the field and Kajiado in uh, Masai. We had it for a year and the data could be sent through SMS through Safaricom, the network. And you, you're on your desk in the office and you're getting data. But unfortunately, there were solar, solar panels and the people there were interested in the solar panels. So they, <laughs> they, they took the panel. We had the same thing happen. Yes. In our experience. Yes. So it's very useful and I'm excited. I'll get in touch with him, guide him around because we are still reviving. I'm still part of the network on Africa Soil Society. So we have a network for the whole of Africa. So we, we have a lot to do, even though they think I've retired. It retired doesn't mean you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And theft is not just an issue in Kenya. Um, in Cambodia, when I was doing my PhD, we had, um, I was putting in a, a mini weather station and I, we dug the hole, put the cement in and the post, the strainer post to come back the next day and mount the weather station. Luckily we did not because when we got there the next morning, the posts, concrete, everything was gone. So they didn't even get as far as the solar panels. <laughs> so it is an issue all around. Uh, a question down here. I'll give you this one and give it back. Uh, thank you for the good presentation. My name is Dr. Apollo. Uh, Kamau from Moranga County Government, uh, and Moranga is where the avocado is, is speaking. The last speaker made a statement, money need to keep coming when it comes that percent to come to Moranga. My question is on the balance between the wheat that you want uh, to keep on the farm so that the pollinators come. Wouldn't the weed also be the host uh, for pests? And how do you keep uh, that balance? The other question I, I had is on the production. The last speaker also sp spoke on the production per acre has flattened over the years. So what, what is it that we are not doing and what do we need to do so that with technology and new information that that production per acre is, is also growing? I also had a concern on, on water uh, because I've seen farmers are suffering because of water logging and because of the hairiness of the avocado roots and you see trees starting to die. So what is the balance on that water? Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of, uh, lot of questions there. Who, who would like to start? Catherine? Okay, I can start. When I talked about the weeds, I meant you could, you, uh, as much as they, I'm calling them weeds, you can also manage them. They don't have to be right under the canopies of the trees. They could be at the hedges, as Dr. Terry had said, at the edges, right at the edges of, the, of, uh, of your farm. But they, they have to be the colorful ones, not always uh, uh, are useful. So for me, I use the, the Marora. I think that one is the one which is used everywhere. So if it can be managed well at the edges, I think it can still work for us. So that we don't think that all weeds are bad. The weeds which have got bright, yeah, bright flowers, I think are good for the farm, at least for the, for the bees, yeah. And at the risk of, uh, uh entertaining the, the pests, you perhaps need to pick on the weeds that are not related to the crop. No. Weeds, depending on which crop now, this is kind of because uh, avocado is not the only crop. So if you are, your crop is beans, for example, no. then the weeds that are related, closely related to the bean, uh, should, should, should not be the one that should be entertaining your pollinators. If you go to other farm of the weeds, those bright flowers that she's talking about. Thank you. 
I want to make it a bit complex uh, in terms of uh, the diversity we are looking at at the farm on the orchard. So other than the ages that would be refuge for uh, uh, you know, bees, there are also other beneficial uh, animals and let's say birds, uh, for instance, they come and chop out probably some of the insects that are a problem to your, to your, to your orchard. So we want to incre increase that diversity at farm level. So other than these uh, you know, wild uh, patches that you leave on the edges, we also encouraging farmers to plant uh, uh, other, this not only uh, protects your avocado from wind, but also contributes to the, uh, can I say, afforestation that we so aim to, 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 to get. For instance, the EU uh, Green Deal again encourages this. We don't want our orchards, avocado orchards, to be seen uh, to, or to contribute in any way to deforestation. So this is another way to in increase the diversity at farm level. Uh, those patches, but also planting trees like Grevelia and others to wind protection, but also in, uh, contributing to the to the uh, you know greening our farms as well. Thank you. The other question, yeah, the Let's issue of crop productivity. How do we increase it? It was flatlined. Um, now we have a good production guide. It was launched two weeks ago, third of May. I missed the launch. I'm so upset. They have sent me the electronic copy, and those ones can be shared. Um, I think they are doing some special print. So you'll be able to access the good production guide um, to be able to really guide you. This thing is evil. There is nothing that is missing there. Um, a whole bunch of um, experts came together in Kenya over about a year and something, and they were able to develop this good production guide. So if you practice good agriculture practices, then your yields will go up. You have to prune your trees. Yeah? Don't just let them grow wild. The bigger, the better, the more fruits. That's not working. You have to prune them and keep the center open to allow them to dry. And therefore, you get less issues of pests and diseases. You must feed your trees, whether you're using farmyard manure and whatever. Those are the works where we're still going to follow a syllab about that because farmyard de manure from a chicken and from a goat and a cow, they're different. So which is the best one for avocado? Dr. Esalaba will tell us one day. And then the issues of reducing post-harvest losses. Those are the four big areas that you need to look. And then, of course, don't forget the pollinators that Dr. Nyamongo is talking a lot about. If we're able to practice this good agriculture practices, you're planting the correct variety. You don't go on the side of the road and buy anything. Therefore, you're buying an avocado full of phytophthora. Then you wonder why your plants are not growing as fast as your neighbors, because they're trying to fight to weed off that particular disease. Better get your avocado from your, a source you know. And actually, what we're doing through Muranga country, uh, Alex Mwaniki, uh, the next uh, series of, um, of uh, seedlings in Calro will be marked with a barcode. I'm hoping that tomorrow, I will not be here tomorrow. I have another horticulture conference, um, public day. So um, that's why I was put last to talk today. But if you can let Robert Musioki talk tomorrow in what Carl was doing in seed production systems, he'll give a five minute presentation. I think it will go a long way to ensure that in addition to what Bob talks about high health nurseries, what has come up from the different presentations that you have to know where your planting material is coming from. And the issue of back coding, this is what I have followed because of what Alex Maniki said, how come you don't have back coding? So that way, with back coding, you'll be able to know the history, what rootstock was used, when was it grafted, who grafted it, where was it grafted, and all of those good things. So that in the end, a farmer can say, surely, if I buy from this nursery, this is how they perform. But from this one, they don't perform well. And even a farmer has a right to come later on to you and say, I bought us, yet when I grew it, it was some jumbo or shocket or other many varieties that we have here in Kenya. So we want to start going towards good systems, a production of planting material. And I'm hoping that Robert Musioki, Robert, put your hand up, that is given 
uh, actually, you'll have to allow him to talk tomorrow because there's something we're doing for our friend Bob. And now Robert Musioki will take the lead on that one because I'll not be with you tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry, I think uh, your, the question on water logging you asked, uh, I think it has not been covered. So we're recommending that uh, clay soils should be avoided for avocado uh, production. And also what we are recommending farmers before you do your planting, uh, after you've identified your field, please uh, undertake some soil tests. And there are service providers who can be able to do that. Uh, to just ascertain that your soil type is the best, is good for avocado. Also, we are recommending farmers uh, when they are making the orchard to have raised beds. And in those raised beds is where they will uh, mark the points they're going to plant uh, the avocado so that when there's too much water, it uh, naturally drains off. So those are some of the practices we are recommending. And we hope the soil scientists and experts can be able to probably uh, give some good feedback on to that as well. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> okay. I know it's been a long day and I think we're going to wrap up in a minute, but just a final question to our panelists. Um, and I think we started the session with uh, Alan Wolf, so I think we should end it with you as the first comment here. Alan, has Kenya got it right? Are avocados, avocados a sustainable option here? And you can also pass, deflect on to other members of the panel. Sneaky question. Um, I think looking, I, I've been to, I haven't been to many other countries around Africa, um, but overall, if I look, I do look at, and I'm not just being polite because I'm not really good at, very good at being polite. Um, Overall, when you look at the many of the countries around the world and their use of water and stuff, I would say Kenya does is doing things quite sustainably, which, which is sort of what I said at the beginning, that I think you want to make the most of that. You've got smallholder farmers not having irrigation. When we first started here, hearing there was no irrigation, you were sort of just really surprised that you could manage to have these trees. And they've obviously been here a very long time. So I think you're on a good footing for it. Yeah. I actually think one of the questions is how do you, how do you make a story about that and put that out, use that as part of your marketing internationally. There you go. I think I've already commented on the importance of soil and water. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of synthesis we need to do. A lot of data we need to collect that is your legacy data and also new fresh data that is coming up to be useful to feed into the kind of models he has. It's not only water models that we have, we even have other soil fertility models. Thank you. <laughs> um, sustainability, what do we need to do? I think we need to improve our seedling uh, production systems um, so that uh, farmers can go online and know where to get their planting material. At times they're looking for this planting material and if they try after the rain start, they can't find them. So can we automate the seeding production system in addition to the barcoding where a farmer can just go into a phone, even to a cyber cafe and be able to know the availability of planting material nearest to them and even get that planting material delivered to their farm. So the farmer doesn't even have to go there. We have to make it easy for farmers to access planting material, thank you. Biodiversity number one, biodiversity number two, biodiversity number three. My, my final co my comment would be just that I think it's interesting that um, we are meeting the experts now. When I started, I think um, what I found was a, a lot of commercial people. I made a lot of mistakes because I was dealing more with people who, want, who are trying to make money out of like going to sell their products. But as I went down and made those mistakes, I was able to go to now the experts, like the, some of them who are here on the panel. And I think it is important for avocado 
for the farmers to reach out to experts. Don't fear what they'll tell you. They might tell you, you need to do this, you need to do this, but in the end of the day, it is for our own good. I think that, um, whatever, I don't, I'm not able to say it. I, I'm not able to pronounce it. But I think when, yeah, perfect. <laughs> When it came to, I mean, when Bob came to my farm and told me that could be a problem, we were able to work on it very, very quickly. We put, we were able to move uh, the avocados, the, the, those particular trees away. We kept them for a small project that he needed to do, but we were able to now see that particular piece of land where we've planted those trees, we're gonna bring them all down because they, no, they have no value to us. As the tree gets bigger, we need to now to remove it. Now, I was, I'm very thankful for Bob coming to my farm to tell me that, because if he didn't, who would have? I'd have probably lost my whole crop. It's a big farm, and I would, I would hate to imagine if I didn't have that information, what would have happened? So I think it would be important for us farmers to reach out to experts. And when we have them, like in this, this kind of a forum, we need to use them. I don't think these guys are cheap. <laughs> All these guys are doctors and, and, and other things. And I think when they have those, that kind of information, it is for us farmers. And for us farmers, it means the country. And of course, uh, why, why are we doing all this? It's for the betterment of our future. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. What a perfect way to wrap this up. Um, you said that beautifully. So I totally agree, of course. And I would like to thank all of our panelists here this afternoon. Please give them a round of applause. And thanks to all of you also uh, for your efforts, dedication in remaining all day. It's been a big day. And I know often you're not used to sitting all day and, and concentrating on what's been some fairly technical topics today. And we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so thank you for, for staying with us on the journey and, and for being really interactive, engaging. We really appreciate your presence. And um, it gives me a lot of hope to see everyone here today and the strength of the avocado industry in Kenya. So look at this collaboration at work on the stage and, and throughout the whole room. So I think it's, it's wonderful and um, I hope you will continue. Even though our project is ending, it's definitely not the end of uh, avocado research in Kenya, that's for sure. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank you all and uh, please get yourself a refreshment on the way out. Um, they should be where they were this morning at morning tea. Um, don't go home hungry and tired, um, thirsty. And tomorrow morning, I hope that you'll all be back again. Tomorrow, we're going to delve into fruit quality. Um, so you'll be definitely seeing more of these two characters on the stage here, Stephen, the Stephen Allen show with, um, with a lot more um, other people contributing as well. But we'll really get into the topic of fruit quality, which I know is a really uh, important topic, uh, particularly in Kenya at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to your presence and engagement tomorrow. And we will kick off at 9.30 sharp. So please be here before then and do account for Nairobi traffic. I'm sure you all know how that can be. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to everyone, um, the efforts um, that have gone into today.
break 